Good evening. Happy Valentine's Day and welcome to the Monday, February 14th, 2022 committee meetings and committee of the whole meeting for the Mill Creek Township School District Board of Directors. Tonight we are meeting at the Mill Creek Education Center as we are meeting this evening. We're district health and safety plan. Even though the public is now able to attend in person, we'll continue to stream the meetings live on YouTube and all meetings will be recorded for future viewing. We will also continue to Zoom the meetings as well going forward to enhance partic participation in them. You can also view this evening's agenda as well as several additional informational items on our website, www.mtsd.org. In addition, please visit us and like us on our Facebook page, Mill Creek Township School District. I'd also like to remind all speakers, core team members, board members, because of their masks, to speak clearly and distinctly into their microphone so you can be heard by all of our attendees this evening, whether they are here in person or viewing us on Zoom or YouTube. Before we start with the first committee meeting, I do want to highlight a change that will provide some additional transparency to our committee and regular school board meetings. Starting with these meetings and going forward with the future committee and board meetings, the public will now have more visibility to the agenda items and in respect of attachments prior to the meeting date. This will be a Saturday before our scheduled committee and regular board meetings in most circumstances. This will not include all attachments as some contain sensitive information such as personnel report and others, but will include many of them which will give our stakeholders additional information prior to the committee and board meetings. We do this for the purpose of keeping the public informed and engaged on what the various agenda items are rather than just a line item on the subject line. First committee meeting this evening is Instruction and Student Services, Mrs. Winchell. Thank you. Uh, 1.01 .01 roll call. Mrs. Sitter, would you please? Yes. Uh, Ms. Philbeck? Uh, here. Ms. Newsham? Here. Ms. Winchell? Here. Thank you. Item 1.02, approval of the agenda. I'd like to make a motion to approve the agenda this evening. May I have a second? Sure, Janice. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, item 2.01, Instruction and Student Services Committee meeting minutes. I'd like to make a motion that we approve those minutes. May I have a second? Second, Sally. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, action items. We have nine items this evening. Item 3.01, course name change from graphics to graphic arts. Dr. Kavanaugh? Yes, thank you, Ms. Winchell. Uh, the purpose of the course name change is when you talk about graphics versus graphic arts, graphics can mean many things, such as illustrations, graphic novels. When talking to the art department, graphic art is much more specific to the profession, and that includes things such as um, for corporate use, such as advertisement, um, product, product design, and page layout, which is what the course is about. So it's a much better descriptor of what the course actually is. So that's why we're making this request. Okay, thank you. Items 3.02 through 3.05 are all contracts. Dr. Ninetemp, would you like to introduce those? Good evening, yes. Uh, 3.02 is an agree articulation agreement with uh, LECOM and Mill Creek Community Hospital. This is a non-financial uh, agreement. It uh, simply states that we will cooperate with them for students who are admitted in the hospital or into one of the hospital programs, and they too will reciprocate that with us given that we have the appropriate permissions from parents. 3.03, 0 0.04 and 0 0.05 are all individual student contracts with the Barber National Institute. 3.03 uh, .03 and 3.04 are for two different students who both require the support of the Barber National Institute. And 3.05 is simply end dating a student um, as of January 3rd, 2022, a previously agreed agreement. Hey, thank you, Dr. Ninetown. You're welcome. 3.06, the NCTM Regional Conference. Good evening. So for 3.06, we are organizing, uh, based on Mrs. Winchell's recommendation, uh, another NCTM Regional Conference trip that will include five teachers um, representing grades uh, K through five and nine through 12. 
uh, on March 16th through the 18th, um, held in Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, could I just ask how those, I see there are two teachers from Chestnut Hill, two from McDowell, and one from Grandview. How do you go about <coughs> selecting those teachers? So for a, an opportunity such as this, we started with the K-5 to grade level chairs because of their um, attachment directly to their grade level and all five buildings. So we started there um, for K-5, to and those three folks are grade level chairs that are going. Thank you. Okay, item 3.07, the 2021-2022 McDowell High School Spring Athletics Tentative Schedule. We bring form forth the tentative schedules for baseball, softball, boys and girls lacrosse, boys tennis, boys volleyball, and boys and girls track and field. If any adjustments need to be made from this point after the board votes at the end of the month to approve, the schedules will be updated on the website. But these are the tentative schedules to post. Okay, and I believe you also have item 3.08, the 2022 Southeast Regional Tuba Conference. Yes, we're asking permission to send one of our music teachers, our Westlake music teacher, to Georgia, where he would participate as a guest artist and clinician, as, long, as well as attend the conference. I have a quick question on that. Can I ask sure. now? Um, I just wondered why he's not flying and he's driving. Um, because the tube itself and some of the equipment he needs to bring is much too big to travel with. Yeah, so it's, he think. prefer the car. That's why. I did ask the same question when he first applied. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'd like to... Um, make a motion to bring forward 3.01 through 3.08. We have a second. Janice. Is there any discussion about items 3.01 through 3.08? Just a comment. I'm thrilled about the NCTM conference. I attended one myself when I was in education, and it was amazing. So I, I'm glad that we're doing that. We got very good feedback after the first one, and I'm sure we'll get the same. We're going to put those two groups together so we can spread the wealth. Ms. Winchell, I have a question. So I'm glad to see that one of our teachers is recognized and heading to that conference down in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I'm going to assume that uh, lodging and meals is being covered since they're a guest for the event? I would assume so because he did not, when he filled out the um, absentee, bell, or absentee question, he did not ask for anything further. He just said all we needed was registration and travel. <coughs> From a safety perspective, 1,500 miles to travel by car is a significant risk to an employee that's on the books for that entire travel time. Are we dictating how many hours they can drive in a day to make sure that they're driving in a safe fashion while they're an employee? I am not aware of any policy that states that. We would expect uh, that our employees would follow the reasonable standard of care in driving their own vehicle. But we would be on the hook for workman's comp should they decide to drive that in one straight shot and have an accident. Yeah. Unless they did something intentionally. Uh, so I, I would just like to, I don't want to get into the specific, I would like to think that we would be having a conversation to make sure that the travel is appropriate with the distance and the time off associated with it. That's an excellent point, uh, Mr. Linder, but I have the utmost confidence in the judgment, both professional and personal judgment of our teachers, and I believe that um, he will make a prudent decision to make sure that he gets back home safely to his family. I believe so. But we'll certainly have that conversation. Is there any other discussion in items 3.01 through 3.08? I have a question about the athletic schedule. Yes. Do we typically have um, games scheduled during our break period, and is that just because we can't schedule around all the school's break periods? Well, but it varies year to year, but yes, we do typically play games during that time frame because every school throughout, depending on where you're playing and when, is not on the same calendar as we are. Any other discussion? Okay, hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Uh, the last item under action is 3.09, the health and safety plan. Thank you, Mrs. Winchell. Uh, this evening, I certainly would like to address our current, current health and safety plan. 
Um, before I get started, certainly want to acknowledge the presence of some of our student athletes. It's good to have them in our presence today. You know, it's a matter of statistical fact that we are still in the midst of a challenging public health crisis. With COVID positive rates, though, trending in a direction that really bodes well for us to return to some normalcy soon. But given these changes, I believe, and as I've continued to monitor in partnership with the pandemic team, I've received peer and feedback and input. I think this is a good time for us to revisit our health and safety plan with some consideration for some recommendations and some updates. Given the significant decline in COVID-19 positive data in our schools, um, if you look at our dashboard today, the numbers have never looked as promising as they do now. Um, in addition to that, in schools across Erie County and Northwest PA, and certainly nationwide, this truly is a ripe time to revisit our mitigation protocols and our health and safety plan by considering revisions to the following. Page three, item A, and parents, I apologize, you do not have access to the plan in your hands, but if you do, follow along with me. Page three, item A, which states that universal and correct wearing of masks is important. Page three, item G, which speaks to efforts to provide COVID-19 vaccinations to the school community. There is an additional requirement from the CDC. Again, we continue to get lots of updates and guidance from the CDC and our health partners, but recently the CDC provided a, an additional update, and this was shared with us on, the, on January 26 by the Erie County Department of Health, which requires vaccinated individuals to have the booster shot, regardless of which vaccine they have taken by March 1st, in order for them to be considered fully vaccinated. So that's something that I want us to certainly think about with these revisions. With regards to page three of the Health and Safety Plan item F, which states that diagnostic and screening and testing must be in place. I'm excited to announce that we will have a drive-through testing uh, facility at the MEC, this location, in the coming weeks as a result of a partnership with the pandemic team and a grant that was written. Additionally, the following revisions will be part of my recommendation from page six, item 3A, which reads, uh, Mill Creek Township School District, in determining the district's masking policy for grades K-12, the Board of School Directors will take into consideration local and county COVID-19 infection rates, community spread, and vaccination rates, as well as consideration of guidance for K-12 guidance on masking and mask wearing from the CDC, PDE, and the Department of Health. In addition to this item, the superintendent, which is item, sorry, page six, item three, a which states that the superintendent and pandemic team will use the individual school metric percent and uphold and look at the threshold of numbers to determine when parent choice takes effect. This is not in our health and safety plan, but board, it's likely to be my recommendation to you all as we revisit our current masking mandates. The second sort of sharing that I want to have is I want us to think about and consider using the school and district numbers with yours truly the superintendent's discretion as to when the department of health's numbers that they share with us around the erie county positive rates should be considered as a data point i'm not questioning the validity of the department of health but looking at our current numbers having consideration for where our students are in terms of masking that percentage of teachers who've also asked for us to consider masking to be their choice. And certainly, as I've stated over and over again, we value the input from parents around their requests as to how we should proceed with our mitigation efforts. So in the event that an individual school exceeds the assigned threshold, and the threshold that I'm speaking of is, we are gonna utilize a 2% of the enrolled number of students in each school to determine whether or not we move towards parent choice. This is certainly a big shift and pivot from our current health and safety plan. We know that as we think about additional data, the hospitalization rates are going on across the state and country. But to remind us, we still have to be cognizant of the fact that we are still in the midst of a public health crisis. 
I intend to bring forth those aforementioned recommendations to the board for revision and adjustments to our health and safety plan at the February 28th meeting. Um, it is my recommendation that these re re adjustments and revisions that will give parent choice to schools based on this threshold of 2% of their enrollment being COVID positive will take effect on March 1st. To give you a, a sort of an additional sense of what this looks like, we've looked at the current enrollment of each of our schools. 2% COVID positive rates, for example, at Asbury Elementary School means that if there are less than 12 cases, COVID positive cases, it will be parent choice to mask or not to mask. And keep in mind that there are parents, students, and teachers who will choose both sides. At Bell Valley, it's parent choice if the number is less than 13 cases. Chestnut Hill, if it's less than eight. Grandview Elementary, if that number is less than 14 cases. At Tracy Elementary, if the number is less than 12. At J.S. Wilson Middle, if the number is less than 13. At Walnut Creek Middle, if that number is less than 11. At Westlake Middle, if the number is less than 11. At McDowell Intermediate High School, if that number is less than 25. At McDowell Senior High School, if the number is less than 23. And certainly here at the MEC, we want to also make sure that our uh, teammates here, our employees, have the choice of to mask or not to mask if the COVID positive numbers here are less than three. Board, parents, students, community, we will continue to utilize a multifactorial approach to interpret relevant and credible data with a focus this time on the positive cases in each of our buildings. Again, keep in mind, if a building has less than 2% of its student population who are positive, here in choice of masking will be encouraged. Once and if or should the board approve my recommendations to take effect on March 1st, we will have the accompanying number of cases that correlates to each percentage of our buildings on our website, the numbers that I just read to you, so that you can capture and memorialize it. Finally, we have always valued parent choice. We've always valued parent input, but also to recognize that the numbers were not in our favor for us to move towards that. What I want to also share with parents is that while I'm bringing forward these recommendations, the board and I, and I will respectfully and humbly request that the board and I meet for a study session between now and our 28th or February 28th meeting to unpack what my recommendations are, what they look like. It is clear that it is time for us to start to make sure that we are continuing to see the faces of our young people. When I think about our much younger students, for example, I, I walk into many of our elementary schools and I see teachers as they're teaching phonics and other lessons, trying to make sure that they're enunciating and articulating and getting students to understand what is being said. The mass certainly gets in the way. So as superintendent, and I know that my pandemic team and core team also echo some of these sentiments. We had to strike that balance between what is best for all of those who are around us with considerations to individuals who are immunocompromised and also to balance that with this idea of freedom of choice. I believe that the recommendations that I'm bringing forth for us to look at the 2% number is a reasonable one and will give everyone an opportunity to make a choice that best meets their needs. Ultimately, I will also add to this recommendation that should we revisit a place that we were in prior to today, meaning our numbers across the district are of concern to us, I want to have built into the plan that I, in collaboration with the pandemic team, can make a decision that meets the needs of all of our students and staff and move back to universal masking. That decision will always be based in solid data, credible data, and looking individually at where our schools are. I'll pause at this time. Those are my proposed and preview of my recommendations that will happen on the 28th.
Okay, and to put that in context, I'm, I'm looking at the um, case tracking dashboard right now, and it appears that we have 10 cases district wide. And so um, the numbers that you said um, appear to be um, that after March 1st, then we would be talking about parent choice for the most part. Essentially, yes, uh, Mrs. Mitchell. Okay, I, I know it's not by individual school. I'm just assuming that those are all in the same building. And, and, and based on the chart that you were looking at, if I think about the chart that ended the week last week last Friday, um, a, a good example would be if we look at I'll pick a school, uh, Chestnut Hill. As of last Friday, Chestnut Hill was at zero positives for both student and staff, which means that in that instance, it would be parent choice for masking. Um, if I go down the entire chart of positives, the highest number of positive cases we had in an individual building as of last Friday was at McDowell Intermediate and McDowell High School. And that number was 10. And so again, essentially, um, none of these schools as of last Friday met the threshold. So should we have our chart looking this way after March 1st, it will be peer and choice across the board. And then at that study session, we will be looking at the issue of quarantine and what we will be doing with that. Yes, agenda items at that study session um, and, and will be, and I, I believe that will be a public meeting. Mm -hmm. Certainly, parents, we want to encourage you as well and students to come and be a part of that conversation, very robust conversation. We look at quarantining, uh, the practice of contact tracing, and, and one that I shared or alluded to earlier, and that is, um, is this decision uh, taken into consideration the other individuals who are opting to wear masks? Is it considering those individuals who have underlying health conditions. I want to make sure that we, we're now making a decision, in, although we're looking at the data um, in a vacuum and not considering everyone who's a part of this community. Yeah, I think it's important also to realize that it also gives the public uh, some time over the next few weeks to decide. Some parents may want to, you know, parental traces. I may want my children to go virtual. I do not want them in an environment with no masks. And there may be some uh, families that are virtual now that may now want to send their kids back. So it gives them a few few weeks to kind of work through that. But Dr. Roberts, can you just, uh, how will this be communicated as far as mass or no mass to the different buildings and communities? Thank you, President Mitchell. And so looking at the chart and the numbers uh, that I just shared with you all, um, at the end of each week, it's likely on Friday evenings, we will send out a communication to um, all of our parent community, our school community, uh, to share with you which schools have are still below the threshold and will have that option of parent choice. Um, if something changes in the day that the communication will be sent out on Friday, will uh, remind parents in the school community that universal masking is in place. Uh, the information will be shared uh, via email, of course, um, telephone calls. I know parents enjoy hearing my voice in those phone calls, <laughs> um, text messaging, or as well as it will be on our website. We want to make sure we keep you all looped into those updates. Okay. Um, I'd like to make a motion to bring 3.09, the health and safety plan, forward to the meeting on February 28th. May I have a second? Second. Okay. Is there any other discussion about that? Yeah, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion passes. We have um, four instructional items this evening. Um, 4.01 is the math pilot update K through 8. Thank you, Jen. Good evening again. Uh, I wanted to present this informational piece to the board tonight. Um, we are in the process of wrapping up our second pilot session uh, with the HMH into math. I want to extend my gratitude to our pilot partner teachers who have gone above and beyond for us this school year, taking their time to dig into these resources, um, vet them, look at them, align them to our PA Common Core standards, and really, you know, uh, take advantage of this process 
and provide amazing feedback as we look now towards making our decision that we will be presenting to you as the board in April. Uh, in addition to our pilot partners, uh, we had offered access, digital access to all teachers K through eight for them to also have that opportunity to go ahead and look at the resource and uh, vet it, provide feedback and um, discuss with their colleagues pros, cons as we look to make this decision. Any questions? Any questions? So, so how is the final decision made then? So what we're gonna do is we provided uh, an opportunity for individuals to place their feedback in a Google Doc, um, pros, cons. We also have a Google form that they filled out uh, with a multitude of different areas that uh, they were able to rate the resources from standard alignment to assessment practices to differentiation opportunities and so on. So once we collate all that information and work with um, the curriculum department uh, to be able to kind of sort those out, uh, we'll go ahead and move that forward within the core team and then present that to the school board here. Um, do I remember this correctly that you had for pilot teachers they agreed to pilot both of those. So there was not that I piloted this one and I'm loyal to this one. Correct. We okay. wanted to make sure that we had a, um, okay. the opportunity to be true to the process. Um, there was no overlap between the two resources. That way the focus and attention was given to the resource of the moment, if you will. Okay, thank questions? you so much. Thank you. Um, informational item 4.02, speech and debate field trip updates. We have a couple of debates to make you aware of that have been changed. Um, the first one was for the team to go to Mars. They were originally set to go to Pine Richland and then switch to Mars. The Mars one was face-to-face -face and was also more closely aligned to the state rules. And then the other one is a change, actually it's a virtual change to a virtual change. The one they were supposed to attend was going to be at the University of Pennsylvania last weekend. They decided not to attend that one. They're going to go to one this coming weekend, which is virtual, um, through the University of Cal Berkeley instead. And with um, the permission of the committee, I would like to ask to add one more informational change just to keep you guys aware of one, because it's going to happen before the next board meeting. And it's an ROTC trip. So it's ROTC trip uh, number 35. They were supposed to do a drill competition in Springboro, Ohio earlier in the year. It was canceled because of COVID. So they've been looking for another one and all basically all the same teams who are gonna be there have all agreed to go uh, the 25th and 26th of this month to Parkersburg, Parkersburg, West Virginia to fill in for that one. So it's just a switch from one in Ohio that got canceled to one in West Virginia that's gonna happen before the next board meeting. So I wanted to make you aware. Okay, thank you for the update. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Dr. Stoops. Hi, good evening. Um, just a FYI that we have this evening that uh, we are currently engaged in um, serving our MTSD cyber families regarding their satisfaction with our current um, delivery model, which is provided through the Capital Area Online Learning Association, or CAOLA. CAOLA is just an acronym for a consortium by which Mill Creek um, contracts with them to provide online experiences for our families that want to go full-time cyber. In addition, we do offer this cyber experience for credit recovery capacity as well as for summer school. So the survey basically entails um, finding out their overall experience with the CAOLA courses in terms of instruction, um, the learning capacity, and also what their future plans may be regarding uh, cyber engagement because we had a lot of families that have reached out um, either wanting to enroll or disenroll um, depending on how circumstances may change and their um, perspective or practices or um, how the pande pandemic may be affecting them directly. So um, once we get those survey results that will help go a long way towards vetting whether or not it's an engagement we think is the best for MTSD families and students which is what we are hoping to accomplish is this throughout the survey as well as um, looking at other sources that could provide similar like instruction. And we're looking at that primarily in uh, clearly the quality of the curriculum itself. We wanna make sure that we're not gonna offer 
uh, a course that's going to be subpar to what we feel is, is up to um, TSG standards, as well as the costs associated with that course. Um, it's a very competitive market right now, and there are a myriad of factors that go into um, the cost associated with it. We want to make sure we're offering the best experience for our online students. Any questions? When are you making a final decision about what we will be offering to students? Is this? Um, we'll talk. We'll meet with uh, Aaron O'Toole and talk about a specific time frame as it works into the budget and what his. We're, we're expecting within a month to have a lot of the resources vetted, analyzed in terms of cost projection, the level of service that they can provide to us, and uh, really take a deep look to, to ensure that it's the best quality. Mm -hmm. it, it, the time frame would be around the end of March, no later. Okay, so we're talking about a change for next year. If we do, in fact, Maybe. recommend a change, it would be at the end of March. I would think we would be comfortable making that recommendation. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stoops. Are we um, doing the LMS? Um, survey or are we moving that forward to the next meeting? Mrs. Winchell, I know that the team um, who administered the survey and, and um, spent an inordinate amount of time speaking with teachers and trying to gauge where we are with this specific agenda item are ready to and prepared to present today. But I believe that there's an appetite for some additional discussions. Okay. And so I would uh, respectfully ask that we table this for the 28th, the meeting in 28th. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, that moves us to 5.01, questions from the public. Mrs. Sitter, do we do that in the room first, or do we do the online first? How, how does that work? Whatever your pleasure is. Doesn't, we have people um, present that would like to ask a question. Okay. Could you go to the podium, please? Could you tell us, please, the subject? Of the health and safety is? plan. Thank you. Um, what is included with the positives that you're re referencing? Is it just actual positives, confirmed positives? Does it include probables? Does it include close, close contacts? What's included there? COVID positives, if you test positive. OK. Um, uh, I know you said contact tracing. Is that going to be discussed at your study session? Absolutely. So we don't know what would happen right now? We that. do not. That's why we want to meet to talk about it. Um, I don't, this doesn't really provide stability for the kids. They're going to be wondering every week, what's going to happen this coming week? Oh my goodness, do I have to put on a mask next week? Am I going to have to not be able to participate in gym class or go to the lunchroom for lunch again? Am I going to have to stay in my lunch? Am I going to have to keep separate from all the kids still? This doesn't provide them with any stability. It doesn't help with their mental health. Why? can't we just move to something permanent? Why can't it be, OK, going forward, this is what's going to happen? Not every week, let's, let's look at the numbers and change, possibly. I don't, I don't understand why it can't just be something permanent. We're still in a time of uncertainty. I believe that it's, it's prudent for us to think about at least giving this a shot now, if you may, continuing to monitor the data. And, and while hope is not a strategy, hopefully we'll, we'll see the numbers continuing to go down that gets us to that place of permanence? I think is a great question. But for right now, I think it's prudent for us to um, have a gradual approach to this. We are grant, it, should the board approve the recommendations beginning March 1st, we are certainly granting parent choice um, in a way that we have not been able to do, before, to do before. So I believe this is the right direction for us. To go so there's, I think if you do a quick Google search, I think it was like 645 kids out of 19 plus million have died from COVID over the whole two years. That's not a very high percentage. I just don't understand still why we can't just move to parental choice today. I know when we spoke previously, you said that there's a chance that today could be a day where that has changed. Why can't today be that day? Why can't the kids tomorrow go to school and see each other's smiling faces and do like they do every other day, every other weekend outside of school, go to sporting events where they're all maskless, having fun, birthday parties. Why can't that happen tomorrow at school? I just don't see a difference. I don't see why outside of school, they can go wrestle with their friends, jump up and down with friends, share drinks, hug friends, 
and then they go to school and they continue to have to do this. Everybody has had almost two years to decide what they're going to do when this day comes, when it's parental choice again. Why do we have to wait longer? We have waited almost two years. Our children have waited almost two years to be parental choice, to have let us make this decision for them. They've had a chance to decide what they're going to do. Why do we have to continue to wait? I just don't okay. understand. Please. It sounds Thank like we're, your yeah, that's my question. Again, I, I'll refer to my previous comment. I think it's prudent for us to, again, have these recommendations, make sure that they're well thought out. Um, we are even creating an opportunity for us to have a study session that includes parents. And then my final point is, I certainly appreciate you sharing the statistics around the number of students that have died, children that have died. I asked the question previously, and I want to ask it again. Whose child should be included in the 600 plus deaths? Whose child? The death of one child should be devastating to all of us. So I want us to make sure that we are building our empathy muscles to think about that. While the number is compelling, let's ask ourselves the question, whose child is, is it OK for them to be included in the fatality of 600 plus children? I agree with you, but at the same time, we can look at mental health. And I don't know those statistics off the top of my head, but maybe we should look at suicide rates and how they've increased along from these kids that have to have all these protocols in place and have this separation. Maybe we need to look at that and consider that as well. And I just I don't see why we have to wait till March 1st for this. Why? Why can't we do something today so these kids can go to school tomorrow? Okay, thank you so Master. much for your comments. And um, I would invite you to attend the study session that we have where we discuss more of the specifics. Thank you. Excuse me, ma'am. Could I have your name for the record, please? Okay, thank you, Jessica. Sure, yeah. Okay, is there anyone else from the audience that would like to speak? Okay, could you tell us your topic and your name as you approach the podium? And your name, sir? Uh, Mark Massoni. I work at Fort LaBeouf. Okay, and three weeks ago, uh, they did away with the masks at the high school, okay, according to the numbers. They did it gradually. They did that first because the cases were down. They felt it was time to gradually, you know, cut the mask, but it was still optional for parents. Uh, just last week, they had the middle schools and two of the grade schools just go maskless just last week okay fort labeouf they do an everyday census on how many positive cases they have it goes online parents can see there's one two five cases it's been working well for the high school thank god okay but it's only been three weeks okay but they are very they look at the numbers they always the superintendent always says we can always go back to mask if the cases go up okay i don't want to cause controversy you know here but i think fort above has a good track of what they're doing i know they are a lot smaller than mill creek all right and mcdowell uh, but they tried this and it's been working it's only been three weeks okay uh i think i think it is working well but then again the cases have been going down for the last two or three weeks. Uh, you say, uh, Mr. Roberts, the cases are going down now. What's the problem in a couple more weeks? I don't, you know, I don't see what the problem is. I don't want to cause controversy, but your school is probably four times bigger than Fort LaBeouf. So I just want to make that case. So working at Fort LaBeouf and parents know that they can always go to mask. And to be honest with you, Probably 98% of the students are maskless right now at Fort LaBeouf. So I just want to let you know. Thank you. I appreciate yep. it. Yep. President Winchell, uh, process check. This, these are questions yeah. from the public about an agenda item. We have another section for public comment. Correct. This process yeah, check. The whole. So again, for the committee meetings, if anyone has a question pertaining to any of the agenda items, you're welcome to come up and ask a question on any of the agenda items. Say your name. Okay, Adams, thank you. You have a question? Okay. <laughs> if you could state um, the topic and your name and your question, please. 
My name is Alyssa McCollum. Um, I have two kids in the school district. Real simple question. I'm just curious. How did you, Dr. Roberts, come to a two percent for their, um, for your criteria for the parents' choice? Thank you. Excellent question. So, in collaboration with the pandemic team, we looked at the percentage that we, we utilized previously at the beginning of the pandemic uh, to determine school closures, and that number was ten percent. But at the time, our data was probably more than five or six times positive cases what it is today. Okay. And so we played around with some of the percentages and landed in two percent thinking it would be a reasonable number. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question. Thank, thank you. you. Another question back here. Again, if you could please state your name and topic. Hi, Amy Stevens, Health and Safety. I guess my question's kind of related to that woman's question. The 2%, I know that Prep and Villa just came out and said 5%. So. Again, I'm just kind of curious, are we just throwing numbers in the air? Um, and I guess my other question is, and which has already been addressed a little bit, if like Chestnut is zero right now, why are we waiting till March 1st? Mm -hmm. If there's zero cases, why, why do we make these poor children suffer for another three weeks? Because you can't tell me that these kids enjoy wearing masks. So two thoughts. One, the reason you'll see some disparity amongst the different districts is not, to my knowledge, none of the superintendents have public health or medical degrees. And so with that said, we are making these decisions based on a multifactorial approach, a number of different data points. And the second reason for waiting is, while the board and I are aligned on making this decision, we want to give parents another opportunity to be part of the discussion because it's, in addition to just making the decision around moving towards um, parent choice for masks, we also want to make sure that we make the right decision for quarantining. Should we keep it? Should we follow the CDC's guidelines? Contact tracing. What are those COVID mitigation protocols? I've said from the time I came into this district that I will never ever make decisions that concerns our student without at least getting some valuable input from parents. And that is exactly what we're going to do between now and the next two weeks before the board considers a recommendation. So it's an excellent question. And I respect question. that. Yeah, excellent um, question. I respect that, but there's a lot of parents in the district that have been waiting two years for uh, parent choice, and we have patiently been waiting, and it just keeps getting, the can keeps getting kicked down further, and I just, I'm concerned for these kids' uh, mental well-being and anxiety. Um, I just, I really would like you guys to really step up and move this process along. Thank you for your hey, question. Thank you. And again, I would invite you to attend the um, study session that we have coming up within the next two weeks. Are there other people in the audience that have a question? Good evening. Lou Aliota, Mill Creek Township. Is that pardon? Topic. Pardon? Topic. Topic. Oh, I didn't understand you Sorry. in your mask. Topic. Pardon? Topic. A topic. Yes. All right. How do you base Dr. Sorry, Roberts? What's the topic? Is it health and safety? Or health and safety? safety, yes. Okay, thank you. How do you and it's a question. A question. I have several questions. How do you determine the positive results from the Department of Health or from local lab of the students and the staff, when I asked for reports from the Department of Health, and I was turned down. These are public documents. The attorney solicitor refused to give it to me. Sir, what is your question? My question is, how do you determine, how do you determine the positive nature of COVID or whatever variant that they're specializing in or promoting now. How do you determine that? Thank you, Ms. Talia. That's an excellent question. Unfortunately, I uh, cannot determine why you were not able to get information from the Department of Health. But each time that my team and I have reached out to the Department of Health, they have furnished us with information. Our determination about a COVID positive case is based on testing and any other guidance provided by the Department of Health. 
Do you believe the Department of Health? I believe the Department of Health is credible and they have practitioners who are qualified to give us information. So the short answer is yes. Are you aware of Governor Wolf intimidating, coercing the Department of Health, of uh, uh, various Department of Health in the Commonwealth? Are you aware of that? I have no such knowledge, Mr. Aliuda. Yeah, it's been, it's been reported. In fact, it's been reported by the Office of Open Records, which they determined that I should receive those public records. What is your question? I, I'm explaining myself, Mr. Senate. Yeah, All right, I'm trying to enlighten, I'm trying to educate, and I'm trying to empower. The purpose of this section is to ask questions. Do you have question. Right? Do you know why Richard Perhax from the Knox Law Firm turned me down? And he said, no, you can't have that. We can't Do you know? questions in regard to the county solicitor's decision. But isn't he, or he was, the solicitor for the Department of Health? Can you ask a question relevant to the Milford School District, please? Oh, Right, public safety. safety. Okay, let's go back. All right. In the public safety of Mill Creek Township, will you incorporate the Johns Hopkins study that identified masks are useless? Will you? We will certainly, again, continue to make sure that we're anchoring all of our decisions in a multifactorial approach. And Johns Hopkins University and Hospital is reputable, so we will certainly consider whatever publications or research findings they have. Okay, thank you. One more question. Does the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania uh, remove the masks? Or have they? Has Governor Wolf? New, New Jersey did? In Mill Creek School District? No, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. We are in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, right? And there are other schools which I have identified that they, they're not using masks anymore. It, it, it's the parent's responsibility, parent choice, right? So if, if you're looking at the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, have they lifted the mask mandate? Dr. Roberts? To my knowledge, they have not, but I'm primarily concerned with meeting the needs of the Mill Creek Township School District parents and community. I do not necessarily uh, spend a lot of time trying to figure out the decisions that the governor is making. I'm sorry. Dr. Yeah. And you're out of order. So, Dr. Roberts, what you're saying is that uh, you will take that into consideration and the board members will take the Johns Hopkins report that masks are useless, will you? That's already, will the, he's already answered that question. Do you have another question, Mr. Elliott? Mr. Elliott, I would say that masks are useless when you wear them on your chin. What kind of a comment was that, Mr. Dean? I'm looking at your mask wearing on your chin. It certainly is useless. What's appropriately? OK, Luke, can we move okay. Okay. Well, what's Please. appropriate? Over, your okay. nose. Um, I think over my nose. Okay. Okay. Mr. Are you a scientist? Mr. Aliota, I, I would oh, invite God, you to you. attend the meeting later on this month. Are there any other people from the audience that would like to ask a question? About I, I do any want of to make items? one comment, Chair Person, that even though the mask, you know, today in two weeks, that the federal bus mandate mask is still in effect till March the 15th. So even if we were to remove the mask from ours, children would still be required to wear masks on the bus. That's a federal mandate up through March 15th at this point. So I want to make that clear also. Any other questions from the audience here? Okay, please approach the podium, state your name and topic. Uh, my name is Aslan Slauson, um, health, safety. Um, okay, I emailed every single one of you on this board and I didn't get an answer. I mean, I'm still waiting for an answer, and I would like an answer. What is your answers? Like, I, I, I really, this is concerning to me. No, I, re I did reply in behalf of all the no, you multiple times, acknowledging your email and asking you to attend these meetings and attend the, now the work session. You, you, 
you did not answer my question. Dr. Roberts, you didn't answer my questions. I, I, I just, I, I put forth that the, the simple fact is, is that kids are getting headaches. I brought this to your attention. I didn't realize this. I had no idea that all of these children are getting headaches. I mean, that, that's directly because of hypercapnia. And yes, it's not the severe, because severe, you die. I mean, that's what happens. So, it, but it's, it's bad enough. I mean, wh why are we s even sitting here saying, I mean, these are our children. Why are we, well, it's only a little bit. It's not the severe form. They're not getting the severe symptoms. I mean, why are we doing this? I mean, this is crazy. This is insanity. I mean, you guys all, like, you're just sitting there. Like, you all agree with this? I mean, this, like, hurts my heart. Like, I just... <laughs> None of you are going to say anything. Like, you, this is just, like, okay. What is your question, ma'am? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I'm willing to answer your question. What is your question? Why are we doing this to our children? You, 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 I asked you for credible evidence. You can't, you, I'm still waiting for it. Then you told me um, the CDC, um, you look at the CDC. The CDC hasn't published one credible piece of evidence in any medical journal. And the reason being is because they have not any credible evidence. They have no peer reviewed study. They have nothing credible medically. Then I sent you all what the CDC, a spokesperson from there said, quoted it. I got, I mean, that's, they use words like unlikely. Most likely it won't happen to your child. Most likely you won't. I mean, anybody knows, when you're using words like likely, unlikely, most likely, that, that's the farthest thing from medicine. Let me answer your question. Certainly, we were not doing anything to children other than in trying to make sure that we protect the health and safety and doing so by anchoring our decisions in credible data. And certainly, we can argue what data is credible and what is not, but I believe that we are making the right decision. What is your credible evidence? I'm still, I, that's my question. Again, we follow the guidance of the CDC, who have, again, regardless of where one lands on, on the CDC's credibility, they have highly qualified public health officials. We're following the guidance of the Erie County Department of Health and certainly having a number of conversations with our local public health providers. That's the answer? That's not telling me any credible evidence. <laughs> this is unbelievable. You guys should be ashamed. We have any other questions from the public? Just say my name again. <laughs> For the record. Me again. Um, I was just sitting back there thinking about the pandemic team. My first question is how many people are on this team? And is it just people who work in the school district or are people from the public like allowed to be in on this committee? I'm, I just want more information on that because as a registered nurse, it's something that I would like to be interested in, interest, I can say it, interested in doing if that was available. Because just with my dealings with the pandemic team, I know that they're swamped or that's what I hear from a lot of people. And I just didn't know if there was any, um, like the public can do anything to assist with that or be on the committee to help make these decisions. The pandemic team actually consists of a number of individuals, uh, which also includes a public health official um, and epidemiologist actually under the, under the team, so yes. Okay, how many people are there total? Just curious. Under the team? Yeah. Eight, about eight or maybe. Eight people? Ten. Ten? Ten. How many of them are healthcare professionals? And how many of them are, is it like a makeup of the school board, some nurses, some a, a doctor? We do have registered nurse on, on, on the pandemic team as well as a medical doctor. Okay. Is that and something that. Disease person, yeah. Okay. I mean, I don't need the burning answer right now, but just would I be able to email you just to find out? like what the makeup is and numbers wise on the Absolutely. team. Okay. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Thank you. Mrs. Sitter, do we have anyone in our Zoom audience with we questions? We do. Uh, Janine Mattern actually had her hand raised first. So, Janine. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. I, I have two questions. So, Dr. Roberts had mentioned that March 1st, uh, depending on 2% or lower mass choice. So, my first question is, and this, I'm sure this is very highly unlikely. If the MIHS is mask optional, but McDowell is not, and we have students that travel, is it they put their mask on before they enter the building that it's still masking? And then I also have a question about, um, and I don't know if we still do, but we used to have middle school students that traveled to the high school for algebra. Um, and what that would look like if the middle school is masked, but the high school is not. And then I had heard Dr. or Gary Winchell mention that the transportation was lifting masks um, supposedly on the 15th. Now, if transportation lifts the masks and they're not wearing them on the bus, but then when they get to the school and their school has to wear a mask, it, it, I'm just wondering, is, is that all going to be explained to a student when they have to wear the mask and when they don't have to wear the mask if they decide they don't want to wear the mask? Thank you for your questions. Yes, so the first question, uh, once you are entering any of our buildings that has a universal masking mandate, even if you are a student in a school and that day or that week um, does, that has parent choice, you must wear a mask. Uh, certainly, we want to make sure that we are going to spend an inordinate amount of time providing any updates. Should the board approve these updates and revisions, we will spend an inordinate amount of time communicating the changes to all of our teachers and staff, our students, and certainly continue to make sure that we are very clear about communications to our parents and community members. Okay, you also had mentioned that March 1st and, and your hope that maybe this would bring some of those that are virtual back to school if, if masks are lifted. Um, is it still going to be that you cannot leave cyber until it's a clean break? So that would be the end of March, would be the end of the third quarter. We have or not you made that. Lift that if you lift masks. We have not made that decision. It's under consideration and will likely be discussed at our, our work session. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Sitter. Do we have okay. any others? We do. We have uh, a few others. Troy Prozan is next. Mr. Prozan? Hey, good evening. How are you? We can barely hear you, sir. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Yeah, this is um, in regards to the health and safety plan. Um, I have a question um, about masking. It where's the directive coming from? As far as masking, is it now? Is it the soup? Has it always been just the superintendent making a recommendation, or is it the solicitor stating that it's law? And if it's law, if he could let us all know where in the public school code it actually defines it is okay to mask children because i've went through the entire school code and i don't see that verbiage in there anywhere so can you please let everyone know where the directive's coming from as far as masking originally the directive was from the governor and the pennsylvania department of health uh, and that was in place, and we had to follow that in accordance with the law up until the time that the Supreme Court rendered the decision that uh, that order uh, by the Pennsylvania Department of Health, Secretary of Health, was inappropriate and not in accordance with the rulemaking uh, rules that she is required to follow. And once the Supreme Court made that determination, it was no longer a mandate by law in accordance with the Pennsylvania Secretary of Health. Subsequent to that, then subsequent to that, um, then it's based on uh, the school board's uh, power under the school code. And there's various sections of the school code and the Department of Education regulations and the Department of Health regulations that we would rely on for the determination that the school board does have the power to require masks going into school for the protection, the health and safety of its students. Where, where is that? Where is that language, though? Where does it say that they have the power to mask children? It 
Because you're, you're, tip, you're tiptoeing around the question. Where in the school code does it say that that children can be masked by school boards? There's various sections, as I said, in the school code that allow. Where does it say so, it? Where does it say it? Where does it say that school boards can mask children? It doesn't you're not answer the question. When you're done asking the question, I'll answer the question. You can't answer the question because it's I not. I can't in there. answer the question. It is right. there are very. There are various sections of the school code that allow the school board to establish rules and regulations in regard to uh, the health and safety of its students. One of those decisions can be that they can require masking. So it states in there that the they answer can require masking. They can. So it states in there that they can require masking. That's yes. the exact word wording in there. No, that that exact wording that you're saying is not exactly in the school code. No. Okay, so what are the what is the exact wording then? It's in it's in the school code. You can but where? Where? Five hundred one. I'm asking you where it is 11, so people know where to look. Various sections. I can provide you an entire list of regulations and sections of the school code. You don't have to provide it with me because I have my own, I have you my own. Have it. I know you it's have. It. I there. already gave it to you originally. It's not in there. Well, that's your opinion. No. No, it's not my opinion. It's a matter of fact. You can't answer the question because it's not in there. Mr. President, do you have any other questions? Yes. Where in the school code does it say that school board directors can mask children? I've already answered that question. But you didn't answer the question. Okay, Mr. So, Prozan, obviously it's a difference of opinion. Attorney Senate said he provided it. You said it's not there. So okay, so we're masking answer. the kids based on opinion then? No, we're masking it based on the uh, Sections of the Pennsylvania School Code and the section of the Department of Education regulations, which I've already provided to you. Okay. Okay, the next person we have is Dan Olms. Are you there, Jan? You will probably have to unmute yourself. You can go ahead and speak. Do you have a question? Okay. Maybe we can circle back and. No, she was try the last Jan. one that had her hand raised, unless there's some others here. Jan, are you able to hear us? Last call, Jan. Okay. Item 6.01. I'd just like, before you move on to the adjournment, I'd just like to say, you know, two weeks, March 1st is two weeks from tomorrow. And, um, you know, I hope that everyone gives us some grace that, you know, where we're at right now, there's still a lot. We're having a public meeting at some point between now and then. I know many of you are passionate about removing the mask, but there's just as many parents passionate about keeping them. We need them to have an opportunity to also during the public meeting, too, because their children may be at risk or they feel. So, it's, it's two weeks. It's been two years, I understand, but we just asked for two weeks so we can have the public hearing, so we can have a good dialogue to uh, move forward with the recommendation. As you heard, many questions are still. Ms. Matter had some great questions about, you know, going between the two buildings. There's questions out there we don't even know that exist right now. So I think it, we would be uh, irrational to today, let's pass it tonight, you know, without so many unknowns out there. So I just want to say that be gracious with us. Other school districts are still filtering through this the same way, you know, trying to figure it out. And I know Dr. Roberts will be talking to many of them over the next week or two to get their input of how they're addressing some of these questions as well. So, Ms. Winchell, thank you. Thank you. Well said. Um, item 6.01, I'd like to move for adjournment. May I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next uh, committee meeting is finance and operations. Mr. Linder. Thank you, President Winchell. Uh, Ms. Sitter, if we can, we can start with the roll call this evening. Sure. OK, 
Okay, Mr. Lindner. Here. Mr. Winchell. Here. Mr. Kobilka. Here. Okay. Uh, item 1.02, approval agenda. I'd like to bring the agenda forward. Can I have a second? Second, Kobilka. Is there any discussion? Yes, I think there's a deletion and under. Oh, no, we're in finance operations. I'm sorry, the wrong thing. Go ahead. It's been a wrong committee. Okay, thank Never you. Mind. I was going to be surprised. <laughs> Like Aaron pulled up, went on tonight. <laughs> okay. Seeing there's no discussion, all those in favor? No problem. Aye. 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 Okay. 2.01 committee meeting minutes of uh, January 10th, 2022. I'd like to bring those forward for approval. I have a second. Second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, this evening we have 13 action items. Uh, Twelve of those action items will be discussed to be brought forward to the 28th school board meeting. One of those action items, and I'm going to take that one first, is to be brought forth to the committee of the whole meeting following the meeting this evening. Uh, I know Ms. Winchell's committee was long. I apologize. I might outpace you tonight <laughs> with ours as well. So uh, those of you in the room, I appreciate that you stay and uh, have your say uh, towards the end. Uh, the first item I'd like to bring up is item... 3.12 the McDowell Auditorium study. And that is uh, to discuss. Mr. Gallagher, would you like to touch base on that first and then we can discuss that one? Yes, thank you. So at the last meeting, we had the presentation from Clark Patterson Lee on the uh, McDowell uh, study uh, for the auditorium and some of those other spaces. Uh, I'm asking tonight. Uh, to move forward with that, uh, with all of the uh, items that we discussed last time, uh, that was a total estimated cost of $9,400,000. Uh, I will note that that will include a fee uh, for additional design services. Um, with that, does anybody have any questions on that study? Just quickly review them again. Yes, I can do that. So, uh, sort of a quick overview of what we're uh, what we're proposing. Uh, so the auditorium, uh, we would change that into uh, educational space, uh, a couple of extra classrooms, um, innovation, STEM lab, uh, maker space, uh, and some large group instruction. Uh, then we would propose to renovate the library, uh, change the uh, cafe portion of it to make it a little uh, larger and upgrade uh, the library to have some breakout spaces. And then uh, consolidate and upgrade the technology um, wing. I guess all of the wood shop and all that would get relocated to the high school uh, and all get renovated. And then renovate the autistic support and life skills in the back of the auditorium. Uh, they currently have uh, space that's inadequate. So we would uh, increase the size of those and renovate those spaces. Uh, and then down at McDowell Intermediate where we pulled some of the uh, tech ed out of there and moved it up to the high school, we would uh, centralize all of uh, home economics and child development. Any other questions on that? Um, does that displace any other, when you moved the home ec, was there something involved there with music room? Yes, uh, but we found a location for that. So the keyboard uh, room actually becomes the child development room. Uh, but there will be another classroom that'll be right there uh, that they'll get relocated to. And then we will actually gain two classrooms on the second floor uh, for additional uh, educational space. And the music department is okay with where that location is? Yes, and that's where we can still work through some of that <coughs> stuff. This is kind of the big concept ideas. Uh, so I am confident we will be able to make something that works for them uh, on that lower level to keep all the music department together. Thank you. Yep. So before we get too far down the discussion, because I think there's going to be a little bit more here, um, I'd like to bring this item forward as a motion uh, to discuss, to bring it forward to the committee, the whole meeting following the meetings this evening. And I have a second for that. A second. Okay, now into formal discussion. Um, Mr. Gallagher, thank you for staying. Um, I know I asked the question, I know Ms. Lupacek asked the same question. How many students are moving per block as a result of this change in programming between the two buildings? Yes, so uh, John Cavanaugh, uh, I appreciate he took the time to talk to both of the admin teams and they're estimating about 90 additional students per block will be uh, uh, traveling between the two schools. And maybe you know this answer, uh, but maybe Dr. Cavanaugh can help us. What is the total number of students now moving for those of us who, it's 90 more, 90 more than what? 
So what is the base number that's already moving per block? I'm not sure if he determined that. Um, I will tell you, he did say that both teams were not worried from a actual being able to get the kids from point A to point B with the allotted amount of time. Uh, obviously, the safety was kind of the, the reason you were bringing it up. Um, but I do not know the, uh, the quantity now of students that move. So that, that would be my question is how many students total are going to be outside of the buildings in the class period changes? Um, and what type of risk assessment has the district done? And what level of risk are we willing to accept? Or does that walkway finally have to be addressed because of this additional risk that we're now instituting into this change? That's, I think that's, I don't have a question or a concern about the project. I think the project is valid. I think that the question is, what is the level of risk the board and the district are accepting, and how are we mitigating that risk with the students to accommodate this change? So I will add, um, and I know you know this, uh, Clark Patterson Lee did take a look at that uh, walkway to see what we could do with it. Um, they had a little bit of a, uh, I didn't actually share this study yet because they're still completing it. It's in draft form. They'll complete it when they complete the Gus Anderson Field uh, study uh, portion. Um, they looked into all of the requirements uh, for putting uh, a raised walkway between the two schools. Um, the biggest thing is you got to maintain the fire lanes around both buildings. So they looked at doing a raised one. Uh, they're estimating it would be a couple million dollars in order to make that happen. And then we would have to get through quite a few you know, BIU review and all that kind of stuff. So it, it would be a difficult task. Uh, they came up with a few other ideas, um, putting up additional fencing, and they'll provide more details on that um, when they provide us the Gus Anderson Field study. Um, I just wanted to give you that, that information. But you're right. That is the question. So that, that, that's the big, for me, that's the big concern. I'm not worried about the, the cost of this program. While it is significant, I see the value and what it brings to the two schools. I just want to make sure that we don't find ourselves in a position where we have a greater liability and we are trying to incorporate this walkway in at a later date. I would rather see if this is something that the district feels needs to be mitigated, that we explore all the options of how to fix this deficiency that has been out there for a while or has been concerned by the district for many years. Yeah. Just because I did hear the question about how many go e between each block, that's unfortunately very difficult to say from year to year because it's based on the courses and the course selections there. My estimation is a couple hundred going from one building to another at each time. So you're probably talking three to 400 at a time going back and forth already. So add 90 more onto that. So if we're moving 400 students per block, we're moving almost a fifth of the student population every period. Not every period, no. Depends on what the courses are that are offered at that particular time. There's certain blocks that have more classes that kids come down to. Like when all the music classes are down at, at MIHS, every kid who wants music from high school is all coming down. Everybody for um, lifetime fitness is all coming down. So there are certain blocks where it's busier. There's other ones that might only be closer to 200. It depends year to year, class to class, what the offerings are and how many students choose those courses. So you're saying we could potentially flex between 10% and 20% of the student population traveling, depending on the block? I would say about 10%, yes, is a pretty safe number. And again, that's an estimate I don't have exact. I mean, if you want to give me a little bit of time, I could go give you every kid that travels every block this year and report back to you at the next board meeting if you think that is necessary. That is my question to, the, to my colleagues on the board and to Dr. Roberts. What level are we willing to say that we need to address the walkway at, in order to do this project. And maybe I'm in, uh, pushing an agenda that nobody else feels is appropriate. And that's my question to, to my colleagues when we vote on this at the Committee of the Whole. What, what does that walkway factor into the decision of making this project happen? Well, I guess my yeah. question is when were we coming, were you coming back to us with a Gus Anderson proposal and why is the walkway part of Gus instead of part of this? So the walkway got added um, a couple weeks ago when we were talking about it. There was no, I wasn't given direction to look into it before. Um, and then the biggest reason why we're coming with this now is I need to move on this in order to keep our timelines with trying to get the high school started in 2023 with the funding and everything else that needs to be done. And I don't want to rush through 
you know, we got to get input from the teachers and everybody to make sure we make the right decision on how we spend the money. Does that answer your question? Uh, what's the timing on gas? They told me by the end of March. And then I will try to get that turned, whatever we decide, I will try to get the walkway turned around quickly. Now, Gus Anderson gets into another whole thing because the study's going to say how much and how far we want to go with that. Um, so that would be, you know, the only concern is depending on what they come up with, whether we have the funding in place to actually do Gus Anderson's work. Now, you're referring to the, <clears throat> excuse me, the walkway being raised, correct? Because you, you talked about the fire lane, so you probably need like a 14 or 15 foot clearance, at least on the McDowell side. So that means it would terminate on the second floor at McDowell, more than likely? That's, that would be the difficult part, yep. Um, and then the stairwells aren't code compliant, and they'd all have to be ADA compliant. And uh, then you, you go down the line, and then you would want to raise it, I assume, at McDowell Intermediate and try to hit that higher as well. Um, because you want to enclose it all the way from one building to the other. I'm and kind of assuming the natural grade at the intermediate side might play might, into it, that it wouldn't have to be as high. Yeah. You know, but if you go underground, then you've got ventilation issues and such, right? I mean, if we considered doing an underground, um, yeah, that would, I think that would, that would be, be probably pretty, much more expensive than the overhead. Uh, I think so. so yeah. One of the other challenges we have is not necessarily McDowell so much, it's MIHS, because MIHS is ringed by the service lane for cars. So we have to cross a road there. At, MI, at McDowell, we're not technically, we could find a way to not block a fire lane because yeah. the fire lane comes from both directions into the back of that building. But MIHS, we, we would have to circum, to cut apart the existing transportation pathway. Um, but I know Mr. Gallagher and I have talked, there's, there's also no statement that that has to be in the spot that it is. There's other ways to get from A to B. Yes, yes. We, we talked about moving the walkway to the back side, just so it's not out in the open. Um, and then at that point, you know, it, it would be a further distance. I know Mike looked at the numbers there. Um, so there's some other options. Uh, they're all, yeah, it's going to be difficult. The, the one thing, like I said, they came back with was they recommended, they've seen this at other schools, is putting another fence in, uh, eight feet off the walkway. And wouldn't look that great, but if safety is the most important thing, um, then you you know you, you make sure vehicles can't get through, uh, and you kind of start putting the putting the fences up. I know we have one area where the ambulance uh, gets into the McDowell or into the Gus Anderson field, but that could be that would be another do one. something different or something like yeah, that. Yeah, and that would be tough because now where do you come in on the other side with the bleachers the way they are and the hill on the back side? the visitors bleachers so yes then that that's another issue you'd have to get through I mean I think it's legitimate because you know you really are going to have one campus with the two buildings you know um, it makes it most sense to be able to utilize both buildings for the majority of stuff but you know we, we do have to consider that uh, um, I know they have one at Edinburgh but that's probably relatively long I want to say it's you know probably better than a thousand feet or something it's a pretty big one but I'm sure it's not cheap perspective it, it's about 600 and roughly 20 feet from MIHS to McDowell on the current path if you were to go behind the building it extends out to about 800 feet if you were going on the back side of Gus Anderson so it's no small ask that's why I'm bringing this up and I'm at I just want to make sure that that's part of this conversation <coughs> we've heard it from parents that have called in on this subject matter, and it's been something that's been uh, asked the Finance and Operations Committee for many years. So I just want to make sure it's part of this conversation because they it's, we're going to kind of exasperate the existing condition. No other discussion? I will, uh, all those in favor of moving the project Moving this item forward to the committee whole meeting this evening. Say aye. 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 Thank you, Mr. Gallagher and Dr. Cavanaugh. Mr. O'Toole, if you'd like to start to take us through the annual comprehensive financial report. And uh, do you think because uh, it's limited because we have so many people comparing to baseball, maybe we should come to that or just hate to keep our students here for so long? Use the words better. 
we could do that presentation. Chris Coughlin's waiting okay. out in the hall to do that presentation right now. Sorry. If you want to move that forward. As long as that's okay, we, we jump to section four. And we, okay, we do that informational item so that we allow the, the professional and the students that are all here in the audience to, to have a thing and to see that. And then would it be acceptable if we took the, the public comment on the, the baseball field at that time so our students can get back to studying this evening? Sure. <laughs> the one thing I would like to mention is that we did bring this as informational, but at the end of the month, we would need some direction from the board on, or at least a committee of what location they would ideally like to see uh, out of this study. With that being said, then if we can, uh, if everyone's in agreement, let's move to item 4.03. Let's uh, review the baseball and softball field study this time. Thank you. Mr. Bilker, are you in agreement with that? I, I am in Thanks. consensus, yes, sir. Good evening, everyone, and happy Valentine's Day. Thank you for bringing me up early. I really appreciate it. I have uh, 15 copies of the report here. Uh, if I could pass these out each way. Need a few more? Oh, just one more, I guess. All of them. Well, good evening, everyone. We're here to talk about the baseball and softball study. There we go. Uh, we have three potential scenarios. First one, for baseball and softball, turfing <coughs> the infield and the outfield both. Second option would be the turf the infield only. So that would mean that the outfield would then be grass. And then the last option would be for all natural grass. Now, before I get into some of these numbers, one thing I'd like to share with you to give you some idea, the turf for baseball typically is about 1.2 million. That's just the turf itself. That doesn't include in bleachers or anything else. So it just gives you some idea. Softball is approximately four hundred and fifty to five hundred thousand dollars because it's dramatically smaller than your typical baseball field. The three sites we're looking at are the Mill Creek Learning Center, the old Asbury School, Walnut Creek Middle School, where the existing baseball fields are now, and then the Hamlin Complex. Mill Creek Learning Center has absolutely zero infiltration. I'm not sure how familiar everybody is with it. Unfortunately, I'm old enough to remember. Gary, you're shaking your head. You remember, too. Back when MIHS was built, a lot of the construction materials and debris went to this site, right behind the school. Over the years, it was filled. It was leveled out in order to create baseball fields and a play area. But unfortunately, that soil does not infiltrate at all. Uh, so what that means to us, more money in stormwater management because we're gonna have to figure out a way in order to get that water into the soil. There's a lot of clay, there's a lot of fill material. The other thing about this site is that we require infrastructure upgrades in order to bring electrical, plumbing, et cetera, into that site, because all that's there now is what is existing for the existing Asbury School. We would consider the Learning Center the least desirable site of the three. The estimated cost is somewhere between three and 3.6 million. If you're familiar with the site at all, this being north is to the top of the page, we'd be able to get both a baseball and softball field on there, but they're both relatively tight. You can see how they fit with each other. Now, as far as irrigation is concerned, this would need to be a rain garden. If any of you are familiar with any of the rain gardens we have in Mill Creek Township, we have a lot of plants growing. You let water in there, and you let the water infiltrate into the soil. So it just wouldn't be a deep pit. It would actually have plants in it. This site as well is very, very tight for two fields, and then parking is also limited. Walnut Creek Middle School. Unfortunately, I remember this quite well. I remember when Walnut Creek Middle School was being built. That soil is fantastic. It's very gravelly. It was farmland at one time. It has excellent infiltration. The water goes right through it for about two feet. Uh, it's probably the best soil in Erie County. You have existing infrastructure there. There's baseball fields there now. There's concession stands. You have electric. You have plumbing. 
So this makes a better site than it would over at the Learning Center. This site also offers you quite a few options. You could have a multi-use field there. In the lower left corner, you can see it's a combination baseball, softball, soccer, lacrosse. You could have a variety of them. You could also turf the existing fields are there. You have two softball fields, a full baseball field, and then two smaller baseball fields. Cost for this site, somewhere between 3 and 3.3 million. The stormwater management difference between this site and the as old Asbury School or Mill Creek Learning Center site is approximately $100,000 to $200,000. The next site we looked at was the handling complex. We have average infiltration here. Uh, if anybody's familiar with that site at all, you know how the water runs to the bottom, uh, creating almost a channel effect there. This has been previously tested by the DEP. We do have some infrastructure there. There's electric there, there's concessions there, there's plumbing there. We would consider this an ideal site and being a realtor just because of location and its proximity to the high school makes a ton of sense. It's right next door. You already have parking and that parking is for that complex only. So we don't have to create more parking like we would at the other schools. Um, this site would actually require channel protection and what that means, if you think about how that slight slopes, we're actually creating a channel with the way the water runoff would be. So we have to somehow stop that water. Stormwater management for this is about the same as it would be for Walnut Creek. There's not much of a difference, which both of those still would be $100,000 to $200,000 less than the Mill Creek Learning Center. Now at this site, we do have to protect the neighbors that are down below and it'll be a one year 24 hour storm. And we have to worry about uh, the degradation and erosion of what's going on in that neighborhood behind us, which I know Sanford has already figured out for us and can be done. Now, if you look at any of the numbers that are in your book, we started at around $3 million. If you were to strip away a lot of the uh, niceties or lighting or bleachers or some of those things, we can almost reduce it by a million dollars, bringing it to about $2 million. With this number on all of these around 3 million, we have dugouts, a press box, bleachers for 50, a concession stand, restrooms, fencing, a grooming device, lighting all the way around both fields, and stormwater management. Now, one thing before I get into alternates and possible uh, changes we could make, all of these fields include um, a rubber pad. I do not recommend doing a field without a rubber pad underneath it. And they also include rubber as the infill, as opposed to being wood, which I'll share with you in a minute. For deducts, in order to go to sod, it's approximately ninety dollars to $120,000. Now, one of the things I can tell you with the problem with sod is we have to wait for the grass to grow. So if you do artificial turf, the minute it's finished, you can start playing on it. If we do turf, depending upon the timing, we might not be able to play on that field for an entire year after it's complete, just so you know, because we have to let that grass grow. And it's all about timing. To just do the turf out or turf the infield and leave the grasses outfield is a savings of approximately $95,000. <clears> oh, <throat> excuse me. And for baseball, to just turf the infield would be a savings of $140,000. Now, one of the interesting things we came up and doing during our study, if everybody's familiar with the, with the rubber that's in the artificial turf, you see it flying everywhere, it gets on everybody's clothes. The other thing that really bothers me about the rubber is the heat. If you've ever seen that during a summer day and you can see the heat coming off, it can be 30 to 40 degrees hotter than the temperature outside. They have a product that is made of wood fiber, and it's about 10 to $15,000 more, but it reduces the heat on that field by 30 to 40 degrees, which to me during the day is huge. We don't worry about it as much as football. Football's played at night, but with baseball, that's, that's big. 
The other thing with the wood fiber is it doesn't have to be groomed as much, and the ball bounce is better on uh, a wood fiber surface as opposed to the rubber. I know baseball really, really likes it, so we want to bring that to your attention. Oh, if anybody wants to see it, touch it. Now, one of the fields we were looking at was uh, a multi-purpose field, which you can see on the left in the photo, which has baseball, softball, lacrosse, soccer. That would be an option for Walnut Creek, just because of the area we have. The ad for that would be somewhere between $350,000 and $500,000. The reason for that is now everything has to become portable. You have portable fencing, and then you'd have to dismantle and re-erect things as it goes on. So that's where a lot of the costs come from. last two options for baseball only now these are costs are a little bit more than what you would see total because we'd be setting up at two different sites baseball only at walnut creek would be somewhere between 2.2 and 2.5 million for softball only at hanlon 1 million 750 thousand to 1 million 825 thousand there are a few of these multi-purpose fields around i know gannon has one the one that's shown here is actually in depew uh, New York, and it's pretty impressive. It's been around for about 15 years. And with that, any questions? I have a couple. Yes. Um, first of all, when about 2018, some of these sites, like there were some permits, there were some permits issued. Yes. Are any of those permits still any good? We have to go back and get them. Unfortunately, no. Okay. Stormwater management has changed in Mill Creek. It hasn't changed a whole lot, but enough that we have to resubmit it. Okay, my next question has to do with safety. I know you talked about the sod or half turf. One of the problems with the field, my understanding is there are a lot of divots out there. So does the, it seems like the turf would make it safer for our students to play out in the field. The divots go away. And the divots go away. Um, you brought up, oh, uh, the wood chips. That sounds great, but this is eerie. I mean, I know it gets hot, but I don't, we're not melting usually. <laughs> um, my next question is, in all the extras for the field, is there a walkway for wheelchair access? I know where that where it's set, um, there were problems with people getting down before. Yes. That's something we'll remedy? Yes, every one of these scenarios has uh, a contingency in there for handicap accessibility in order to get um, a handicap parking space as well as handicap access to the field, okay. to the bleachers. Perfect, perfect. Um, OK, last question. And this is for the Walnut Creek field. We have the MYA contract. Uh, maybe uh, Attorney Senate can talk to that. How would that? How would this impact that? Do they have a right of first refusal? How, do we, how are we going to work that? Based on the agreement and, and the designated areas where you're proposing the multi-field field, I guess, is not within those areas, okay. I believe. All right. So unless you chose to redo one of those fields, we picked one outside of that. Perfect. OK, thank you. Hey, Chris, on the, on the wood fill, What's the durability of that? Like Janine was saying, you know, it's damp, it's wet, it's cold here versus the rubber as far as replacement, life expectancy. Um, you do have to fill it from time to time, but from what I understand, it's just it lasts just as long as the rubber. Well, I'd like to really see the field. There's a couple of them around yeah. here. There's one in Ashtabula. I'd also like to talk to the coaches about it. I haven't used it. I don't like being a guinea pig. I'm very familiar with the rubber. Um, but the wood makes a lot of sense. And I will tell you that 30 to 40 degrees is huge. Um, where I first witnessed it was out of Gerald McLean when we did their turf field. And we were doing the track and the turf. And I remember one of the guys grabbing a piece of turf and he walked over to the track, which is black, threw it on the ground, and he was going to assemble a soccer goal. He burned his knees on that rubber because it was so hot. I mean, it's absolutely amazing how much heat comes off of that rubber. So if we could save 30 to 40 degrees with that, that's enormous during the day for these Here's kids playing on that field. And this compared to the turf. With grass, we have to wait until the grass grows, dries out, all of that. Turf, you can play on it. We also extend our season. You can start playing earlier as soon as you can get to see the field. Um, what about this? Same thing. Okay. You'll be able to play on it all the time. So it will extend the season. It extends our playing season that's shortened right now because it's covered. Um, we actually have a uh, full turf softball field in Cory. They use it for. Uh, gym class in the winter, you know, when we don't have four feet of snow on it, which was this year for a couple weeks. Chris, at the Hanlon complex, not the Hanlon, but where the baseball field is now, we talk about the drainage, but there's always been a problem with that. I mean, back in the 15 years ago, 
you know, we put $100,000 into that side hill to stop. Well, we had it fixed, then fixed it. So what's Lee's confidence that they've got to figure it out now? Well, we know you have a water vein that's about 15 feet underneath the middle of that parking lot up, up top, too. Um, I know Stanford, he does this all the time. He does it every day. He feels very confident he's going to be able to resolve it. I mean, we don't have much of a choice with stormwater. You have to. Correct. You know, so I mean, when they come back and test it, we have to resolve it. But I have full confidence that Michael Design Assistant will resolve it. With minimal impact with uh, the neighbors below? Correct. Well, um, the beauty of that is the fact that that's where all of it stops, right at the bottom. There's almost a natural stop for that down there at the bottom. And that's where that stormwater would be. Is there an issue with the lighting with the neighbors down there, too? There would be. Um, we have to make sure that we're not polluting uh, the neighbors down there, because that would be an awful lot of light down there. But yeah. they can direct those appropriately as well. Yeah. I have a question about the, the lighting at Hanlon. This bid only, or this estimate, I'm sorry, only includes lighting for the baseball and softball fields, not for the, the existing field that's there. That's correct. OK. What's the life expectancy of a turf field? I wish you could see my smile right now because of actually I was out at Joe McLean the other day who's on 15 years of theirs. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, we see 10 to 12. Yeah. Um, no offense, one of the toughest things on these fields are the bands. Uh, the bands going back and forth in lines and repetition. So if you have a lot of band practices or you hold a lot of band events, those are typically the fields you see in 10 years that are done. In terms of the hybrid fields, it's my understanding that the hybrid feel is nice from a cost perspective, but maybe some of these baseball players can answer this. But you run into problems where you can't wear the same cleats in the outfield on the grass that you're wearing on the turf. That's true. Because you're transitioning from natural grass to turf, there's a difference. And there's also that transition between the two as well. But it is a cost savings. What is the field that UPMC has, the old Jerry Hood downtown? I think they're grass still. Oh, well, they're yeah. grass, yeah. Most major leagues are grass now. And you guys have played at uh, the, uh, the Jerry Hood Park, um, but UPMC. I'm sure that that doesn't have problems with divots and such because it's maintained. Right. So, I mean, if we did a, a whole new base and we went with turf versus uh, or not turf, we went with natural grass, whatever you call it. But we completely put a base down and such. Isn't that a good option? Because I, I get the part that it's all ratty and such and that that's not good. But if you did completely redo the base and then put sod on top of it, would that be a, a good option? It's an OK option. I would say it's an adequate option. Um, if your district wasn't playing on it all the time and needed it in all the time, and in spring when it's so bad and our weather's so wet, that's what we see the major problem, as you mentioned it right there, is trying to get on that field in March, April, or May, and it's still wet, or we still have snow on it. Um, that's the major advantage to these turf fields. And then plus repair. You're not having to go out and repair and take care of it. You are right. It's a less expensive option. It's a, it's an, a it is another option. It just doesn't offer you the playability that the artificial turf would. And do you have to run that, that big uh, canvas or the, you know, the cover on it when it rains? I always see them do that. That's No, but you would have to run the groomer on it. Uh, just like on the football field, you have to run the groomer and groom the rubber in order to bring it back up. You have to do that on a regular basis with the rubber. You don't have to do that with the wood fiber. And if we were to just do a baseball field, that would be big enough that you could play softball on it. Is that correct? Yes. You know, if you're going to have one or the other, I, I see an option to just have a softball field. That makes no sense. It's small. You know, if you had the baseball field, then you could do softball and just have closer markers or whatever. You could. Right? You'd have to have them movable. Okay. Thank you. Chris, any concern about the two site locations, say the uh, eliminating uh, Mill Creek Learning Center, but, you know, between the Walnut Creek and the current site as far as security, safety, seeing that the current field's kind of tuck back in and obviously spend $3 million versus like Walnut Creek that might be a little bit more open and exposed. You are right. Uh, Walnut Creek is definitely more open and more exposed. Um, when we were looking at it, we looked at location as being one of the biggest things just because of the high school. But you're right. You get down in the bottom. It is way down in there. Now, one of the things I will say, the fact that it has its own parking, it's its own site. Um, that's one of the things like the code's not going to look at us with Walnut Creek Middle School and Asbury. Are we going to have a function there that we'd also have a baseball game at the same time? Mm -hmm. 
Mr. Coughlin, just yes. real quick. I know we talked about the, the handling complex. Uh, there is nothing in code that's, that would make us have to replace the dugout restrooms, concessions, or technically add lighting to Hamlin. So we theoretically can save the existing structure, and we can just go ahead and do the drainage, do the turf, bring that field, and make that playable. And that, that shaves roughly $1.3 million off that number. That's exactly right. And that's one of the advantages of that Hamlin site. Some of that infrastructure is already built in that we wouldn't have to go and redo. Yeah. And I, I will so. tell you, a lot of cost comes in the dugouts, comes in the concessions, comes in the press box, depending upon how far you go. There's no concern with the existing infrastructure at Hamlin baseball no. complex. It's all in good order. Yes. Yeah, not like I was worried about Walnut or um, the Learning Center. Any other questions, comments? Yes, uh, Mr. Winch, President Winchell, if that would be acceptable, I'd like to, to take us uh, section five for public comment, let our, let our athletes maybe, or anybody in the public that might want to make a comment on this presentation, sure. while the professionals here that could help us answer some of those. Sure. So. Any questions from the public concerning the baseball presentation? Yeah, just state your name, please. and. Direct your question to the board and to Mr. Coughlin. All right, I have a statement, but it's probably going to change based on everything we just heard. Um, and I could probably change it and change it over and over 100 million times because I already have today. Uh, my name is Rebecca Hauer. I've been a taxpayer here in Mill Creek for 10 years. Um, many of you know my older son, Jackson, was a Trojan baseball player until he graduated last year. He now plays uh, for Dartmouth College baseball. And now my younger son, Jake, is a ninth grade, uh, ninth grader at MIHS, and he will be playing baseball for the Trojans this spring, along with many of the young men you see here today um, that have been standing here for hours. I, I, I would like to point out, based on that, I don't think we often see our football players in here. I don't think we've seen our basketball players in here begging you for somewhere to play. I have a son that played basketball in a state of the art beautiful basketball court that we have that I think the community has thoroughly enjoyed watching games on. And we've been very proud of it. And also our football field. I mean, I'm thrilled to have a son playing football now, Jake, who can play on that unbelievable field. People come from out of town and comment on how amazing it is. Then we have this embarrassing, massive a field that we can't play on for our baseball players. It's just not fair. It's just not right. And it's not a new topic. I've been coming to these meetings for four years now and listening to the same discussion. And I, you know, I've always been too afraid. To, I, I'm not a great public speaker and I'm nervous to do it. But I felt that I owed it to all the people who are here for the last four years talking to you, including my older son, the people here four years before that, four years before that, four years before that and I'm probably going back even further than I know talking about this same issue we've spent more than hundred and twenty five thousand dollars on studies we have to continually change permits and, and or, you know resubmit permits spend more money while this discussion continues and continues and continues I was here when it was promised to us and then taken away I know a lot of you are new on this board, and a lot of the people who are new, these families and, and these boys are new to this too, and that will continue to change year to year. I really hope that this board will be the board to finally get it done. And in my opinion, we need to do it right. My sons are both outfielders. They can't play on grass in March. It's just going to be too wet. We live in Erie, Pennsylvania, and we need a turf field, a completely turf field. And we have for years. And I've been all over the country for baseball, and we see these beautiful fields in towns much smaller and school districts much smaller than ours. So I, I implore you to please, please get this done and get this done right. Don't do it on the cheap. Don't try to save money. We have a community here that I think will thoroughly enjoy coming to these games at a beautiful park with lighting 
and a safe field for our boys to play on. It's a total safety hazard right now. I know we have three or two games at least in March that we probably won't play. No way. So on behalf of these boys, and the boys that have come before them and before them and before them and before them, and the ones that are going to come after them and after them and after them, it would just be, I think, really great if this board could be the board to finally get it done. And I believe you will, because you have all the information and you've heard everything that there is to be said and spent all the money to get all the research done. So I think that now is the time to give us something that our community could be proud of. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for the narrative in the back. Are there any specific questions you have about the field or for the young men in this room? Are there any questions that you want to ask us about the field or think that we need to be concerned about? Questioning. Questioning for the so Questioning the, the study. But I appreciate the backstory because it is good. A lot of us are new to this board. And yes, I know a lot of people are new. And, and if I could just add, too, I think uh, this is our, our new coach and all of the people like me who've been here and, and heard all these things and know all the concerns. I think it would be nice to be involved in some of this discussion before decisions are made. Um, again, because we don't want to be coming back year after year after year to discuss it. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my question is, I'm sorry, Rob Hauer. Uh, my question is, because we've gone through this before where we spent all that money to get that analysis of the current field. And there was huge concerns about the drainage. And I heard you speaking about them. And I'm just, I want to hear more about that because I'm not convinced if we're going to sink $3 million to do it right, that that can be fixed and then what do we do after it's built and we're going to be dealing with some and then with those residents the, the, how do we know that that's going to work my question thank you for that question yes thank our you. engineer mike sanford in particular has done a lot of stormwater management in erie county and all over pennsylvania we have rules and regulations we have to meet no matter what we have to meet those regulations and make sure that it's a system that's going to operate efficiently and appropriately. Uh, Mill Creek Township's not going to let us put in a system that would not work. It just wouldn't happen. It, it will be taken care of. So to follow up on that, did, did Mr. Sanford do the first study? Because the, that gentleman's point, all we heard about the first study was how bad the water management was going to be in that site. Um, but your study here specifically says that Walnut Creek and Hanlon, there's not that much of a difference between the water management and cost, roughly. Well, it's infiltration. That's the difference. It's one's infiltration and how we have to handle it. The other one is the <coughs> channel uh, that we have to install at the bottom of the hill. But there is some infiltration at Hanlon, which helps us. But, and I'm pretty sure Mike, I don't think Mike did the drainage on the right. He did the design for us, but I don't think it was ever implemented on that site. That's one thing that's not clear in here. What, how much exactly uh, water, you know, Storm water, water management, management costs? Because I believe when they were in here, they they were almost exactly the same they vary site to site but there it's about four hundred and fifty thousand dollars across each site now mind you that includes the drainage that we're doing for the field as well so if you actually broke out the stormwater management it's about a quarter million dollars because we have a lot of drainage that goes underneath those uh, turf fields and that helps account for our collection <coughs> The, your the comment about the studies, I, and I I could be wrong in my recollection because I was just joining the board as this first conversation took place. I was under the impression that the, the original water study for storm management was almost seven hundred thousand dollars, which is why we pushed to say, is there not a better place? And now we kind of come back, but if, if we changed engineers, I mean, I understand that maybe they've a little different outcome, but uh, I can't say that factually. It's just my recollection from as I just entered the board, so there was a lot going on. Mike, I think it was closer to 500, 500 kit. The whole cost was a million and half of it, that's what I remember in my mind, half of it was for tanks underneath the ground. That's exactly right, Mr. Dean. It was about uh, a little over a million, like say 1.1, 1 
and half a million of that was going towards stormwater. Thank you. Thank you both for clarifying. I, my question, I guess, would be if, if they're saying that they can fix it and put it at the Hanlon Field, wouldn't they have to continue working on it until it's fixed if they say they can do this? Well, this would be part of the design with the new baseball field. So they would have to resolve all the stormwater management problems as part of the permit process. Right. It, yeah, it's kind of a given. It's, it's, it's like saving energy with the new code. I mean, it just comes natural with it. it. We will have to resolve those water issues no matter what. But it wouldn't be on a flat rate. It would be a change order, and it would, could raise substantially to fix it. It's not like, you, oh, we're going to do it for $3 million, It's done. That would be a change order, and if it costs five more million to fix it, as, as Chris says, they'll fix it, but it, it's not a flat rate. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you would continue to pay to get it fixed. Well, if there's a design and the design is approved by the township, the contractor performs that work to the design and it operates the way it's supposed to, there wouldn't be any more. It's done. But if it doesn't, doesn't work the way it's supposed to, then we spend more money to make it work. No, you wouldn't have to because the contractor would be responsible with his bid in order to make it to what he right. bid on. See, the design that's done by Sanford or whoever the engineer might be is the same no matter what. And if a contractor bids on it and they said they're going to do that work, they'd be responsible for doing all that work. You wouldn't be responsible for fixing it or changing it because it's an already approved design. And can we time stamp this today on our recording so that when it, <laughs> when it goes over by a half a million that we're going to say, nope, it's covered. Well, because change orders happen all the time. And when we had the roof go bad at the, uh, at the Asbury Elementary or something, well, you know, the flashing was wrong and this guy went out of business and this guy went bankrupt. So, you know, uh, if, if, it, if it's a single bid and somebody holds a bond for it and it's paid for, God bless America. That's great. But in the real world, I don't believe it. Um, I think we're comparing apples and oranges. When you're talking about natural grade and design of infiltration for water and then a roofing system that's an actual product, because we don't have an actual product that we're using for the uh, stormwater retention. I mean, it's stone, grass, plants, things like that. So it's more of a matter of assembling those materials and making sure they work according to the design that Mill Creek Township told us we needed to perform. As opposed to a design for a roof. Do you see what I'm getting at? That sure. those have materials that are made by different manufacturers and necessarily don't have to meet a performance criteria uh, of the township. Unfortunately, the topography of Mill Creek and all of Erie County is all downhill. <laughs> and there's a, you know, a multi-million dollar across the street from uh, Walnut Creek where somebody wouldn't let them run a ditch through their property. And that keeps getting argued and such. So stormwater is a very volatile. Yes, it is. Thing. You know, and like I said, I'm not at all against it, but I mean, it's just an expensive date and then some. It is. You are right about that. But it's got to be right. If, if the drainage isn't right, then we're right back to where we started. You know, it absolutely has to be right. It has to be dry. It has to drain. It does. Mr. Linder, I have a question. I don't know if it's for you or for Mr. O'Toole. It's about funding. It's not about the design of, of the field itself. But is this something that we're putting forth to roll into our bond or would we be able to use any of the um, committed funds that is for extracurriculars towards the, any of this we're anticipating bond money using bond money it's part of the resolution and we had allocated four million for this project there are no other questions from the public that are even look in zoom are there any hands up in zoom so i don't forget our Online colleagues. I see no hands raised in Zoom. So how long would we take to do to do the field formal? Did the whole park infield outfield that's been afraid? What's the timeline? Is it just one season just to be totally wiped out? You can't park the one infield area. It's all about timing. Um if you wanted to actually have this field for next spring to perform on we probably need that to bid right now. We need, we need to get the materials and everything so that we'd have the fall to finish up. Uh, if you were to bid it this summer, I think you'd be looking at the following year. Have, have 
So you're stopped to track ten games, all of our home games have been put there. Um, this year we're responsible for the West Co games there. They got moved away when they were moved there. We were going to work through it. Um, we have a whole series of games. Okay, no so yes, challenge time schedule is going to impact playability for upcoming seasons. Thank you. We would. You just have to make sure that it, uh, the, the right that the light is aimed appropriately and the light levels are appropriate. That it's not too bright. We can't have too much light pollution. So each one of these takes us into consideration. Yes, uh, we have to make sure that we run that past the township, and then more than likely they're going to probably want to have some type of meeting with everybody about it as well, I would imagine. Well, if we keep the lighting levels to the appropriate levels they're supposed to be, like much like at Gus Anderson, we'd be fine. Because see that you can appropriately light a field that you can have the light on the field and not just light up the sky. In particular with all this new LED lighting like by Musco, I mean it's amazing what they can do with it. Yes, if, Musco Lighting does a lot of the sports lighting throughout Pennsylvania. They're very aware, like with baseball, you need much more light than we do for the football. This would actually be bid because it's state dollars. It would be bid, so it could be anybody. Um, we've worked with several manufacturers. I know A-Turf, they're already in the school district. They're already maintaining some of your fields, so we just use that as a, a baseline. So this project would be like any other project. It would have to go out the bid, and we would go through the viable bidders. So, Appreciate those, those comments. We, we would expect the professional to make sure that that was part of the bid contract. I do have asked if there are additional questions for the board or the professional that you would come up to the, the microphone and we ask those questions. Um, we I, are not a, a third <coughs> of the way through our meeting this evening. Yeah, we, I, I, I do not one, want to cut this discussion short, but I also want to keep us on topic. So if I, there are I have one question questions. on parking. You mentioned the concern at Walnut Creek about multiple events at the same facility, but what did you look at with Hanlon? Because there's tennis at Hanlon, there, the other field is being used for lacrosse, soccer, it's being used all the time. So what's, what is the parking requirement that you use to say that it's adequate? Well, at Hanlon, uh, what we're fortunate there is we don't really have an occupant load, that there's not a time that it's always used, nine to five. With the school, that's what BIU and the township would look at is, well, what if you were to have a game during the day from uh, between nine and three? Well, then we have to accommodate for more parking for those 50 uh, bleachers. On the Hamlin site, we wouldn't because there's no schedule. There's no set occupancy for that site. Um, so that was one of the concerns for both uh, the Learning Center and Walnut Creek is the additional parking required because they could come back and say, well, you need 50 more spots, which we did accommodate for. Because we figured, worst case scenario, they are going to make us put more parking in. That being said, thank you for presenting the study. And thank uh, you. We said we'll, Aaron and Mr. Gallagher will bring that forward potentially at the end of the month here at the board meeting. Uh, I do want to circle us back to section three, which are action items for this evening. Um, as I said, we have 12 more to address this evening. Uh, and, we will start with item 3.01. Mr. Tool, if you would like to take us through the financial report, and if you want to work through the ones that are specifically you, I'm free to let you go out of order, and I will take the ones that belong to me. Yes, uh, thank you. So 3.01 uh, is uh, the annual comprehensive financial report and the single audit uh, report, which essentially this was our audit. However, what we've done in terms of trying to be more transparent 
and making it easier to read is we have moved our normal audit into and applied for the certification for an annual comprehensive report. Essentially what it does is it provides a lot more information, uh, a lot of operating information that allows you to be much more transparent in uh, the numbers that you see there and how we're operating. I, from my understanding is we're the first district in Northwestern Pennsylvania and one of the few in Western Pennsylvania that have applied for the certification for an annual comprehensive re uh, financial report. So that, that's, a, that's a big accomplishment as we're working through because it is a lot of data. If you can uh, refer to page, uh, the first page, and there, there's a letter that I, I wrote that kind of explains our financial position and uh, the outcomes as well as what the driving factors are. If we move on to, um, I'm going to skip through just a couple pages in here just to kind of highlight a few items within the report itself. On page 10, there's a financial highlight section that does give you some information in terms of how uh, the district ended the year. Page 16 is a summary. This is uh, the government governmental activities. Essentially what it is is the report is broken down into your MDNA, your management discussion and analysis, and then it goes into your financial reports, then the notes, then the operating statistics. Uh, the MDNA, the difference between the financial reports and the MDNA is primarily fixed assets and long-term debt. Your long-term debt, meaning accruing your interest uh, in the pension and OPEB uh, liabilities. And then your fixed assets is you're just recognizing depreciation as compared to the financial reports at the fund level. It's more of a, mod it's a modified accrual, but it's more of the cash value that you have that you're paying for. On an annual basis, if you do look through the first 16 pages, it it uh, outlines the differences between the MDNA reporting as well as the fund accounting, and then the notes help supplement that. But if on page 16, our, our net position for their government activities, which is the general fund as well as the capital projects and capital reserve funds, improved by about nine million. I will say about 2.8 million of that is just a reclassification from the government the governmental activities to business activities. Essentially what that was is we wanted to recognize what the true net pension liability as well as OPEB liability was for the food service and child development funds. Historically, they were all recognized in the governmental. Well, we have recognized them moving forward into the respective funds, which is appropriate. Uh, as you can look on page 17, Historically, when you would look at these items, it, it the formatting is different here. We historically reported just local, state, federal revenue, instruction, support services, non-instructional and debt uh, as the line items. You can see here that we've broken it out by specific types of revenue as well as expenditures uh, by department, which that theme will hold consistent throughout the entire report. If we move on to, I'm going to move to page 27. This is at the fund level, as I was talking about, the difference between the government wide and the fund level. Uh, our, fund, our, our funding end balance, or our fund balance, ending balance, was 20.2 million for the general fund, about 30 million for our capital reserve, which is the bond money and about 7.6 million for capital projects. Additional details were all uh, included in this report, but as well as the presentation that I had given in the fall about how we ended the year. Again, I just wanted to reillustrate on page 29, the detail that we provided as compared to what we had been providing historically. 31. As you can see, the non-current liabilities, this is your food service and child development funds. You can see that now we're recognizing OPEB and your pension liabilities. That will also be included in your deferred inflows and outflows, uh, which is going to be a big difference for those funds. Uh, truthfully, they'll never show a positive net, well, I shouldn't say never. It'll be a while before they show a positive net position the same way our government activities because of the pension liability itself. Uh, I mean, our pension liability is about 148 million. 
It's no different than every school district across the state of Pennsylvania has a sizable pension liability because of how underfunded the program is. And then the last item that I wanted to bring everybody's attention to is if you just go to page 77, this is brand new to the report from page 77 to page 108 are operating statistics and it shows a trend. We will uh, typically within an annual comprehensive financial report, you'd like to show 10 years worth of data. Uh, when you're looking at trending, I, I uh, had eight years. I chose eight years because that's when I felt uh, it was the most reliable information is starting about eight years ago as we're moving forward. Um, but we will continue to add years to it until we re reach that 10 year mark. That is a high level of where we are. Uh, the numbers didn't change at all from what I presented back in the fall. Uh, on what our, uh, the outcome was at the end of the year. But again, I just wanted to re reiterate that uh, we did try to provide much more detail in this report. You have history, you have much more, greater detail into the department level, as well as our revenue, in, as we're trying to become much more transparent. Any questions? No questions. Thank you for the, thank you for the transparency and the additional extra information. Um, it is in the public side of board docs, so if you would like to read 108 pages of Aaron's sweat, blood, and tears, that's what he's been working on for a while now. We will add additional information to you every year as we continue to move forward. Um, this just was a lot of information to pull all in one year. Um, we did submit, I think in closing, is we did submit the application to have the certification itself. It will take them four to six months until we'll hear back to understand whether or not it's been approved or yeah, no. thank you Aaron for bringing the recommendation to the board and having the board um, you know let you go ahead with this CAFA report for additional transparency to the district thank you, thank you. Uh, moving on to if there's no other further questions I'm going to move on to 3.02 which is the Erie County Technical School budget uh, you can see it, it uh, we have a resolution here that the their budget in total is about expenditures of about 6.966 million um, for secondary program contributions of about 4.77 million yeah, our contribution is roughly 840,000 it was up about 20,000 if I recall correctly there it is attached um, so we would be asking to have this budget approved which has already been approved by the Botech board not been approved by the vote is oh, okay. approved to be brought to the individual school boards this the, the distinct school boards of the uh Erie technical school they will then uh elect to pass or not pass it at the individual board meetings uh, they're asking us to, to do that by the end of this month so that they can then elect to accept the, the budget should it pass did i get that correct attorney senate that's right i had it backwards yeah i apologize okay and uh, mike this is based on our participation rate yes so. this, this is based on our participation rate um we actually saw a fifteen thousand three hundred and six dollar increase to our contribution uh, it's only a 1.84 percent increase <coughs> the technical school had a, an average increase of 3.18 percent uh, and that is due to our uh, participation has declined over the last few years but we uh, Our, our three-year average, uh, we've seen a decline of about 7% over the last three years, and that's why we saw our individual contribution has not increased as much as others, uh, where at other school districts are seeing growth. Um, we, we are seeing, you know, a minimal use of, we're not seeing many students erode away from the program. I'm excited to see that there are a couple of highlights of the, the program. Uh, they're going to bring on a instructor for sports therapy and exercise science program so they are starting to revamp some of their programs there that will be enticing to our students as well so while we may have a declining enrollment uh, or participation at the moment i see that the technical school is changing their, their portfolio of courses so i envision that 
uh, we may see some more of our students uh, return to technical school in the future as some of those courses align with their career opportunities. So it may be safe to say that some of those students are at our mill now, you think? Manufacturing yeah, that, I think our mill has, has changed some of our participation. Yeah, dynamics. Um, yeah. Because we, it is similar to a program that they have there. <laughs> yes, um, that, that program is growing right now as well. Correct. Yeah, thanks. Sorry to interject on your hand. No, you're all right. Thanks. Um, any other discussion with 3.02? Okay, I'll move on to 3.03. It's uh, we're asking a recommendation to approve the E-rate purchases that are attached. They are for additional switches, UPSs, and networking equipment at various Mill Creek Township School District buildings. Essentially what this is is every five years, the federal government replenish or has its approach of uh, funding E-rate. It's E-rate funding, which allows you to, the, the federal government gives you money essentially. They'll pay 60% of your purchasing of networking equipment. Our new funding allotment for the next five years is 1.1 million, which means that we have to spend about $1.8 million in our capital funding equipment. Um, I'll have more information to present on how we plan to spend those funds in March, but this is the first phase at various buildings of upgrading our network equipment. So 60% of that $253,000 that you see purchased will be funded by the federal government. Any questions? This isn't our uh, rate for data. Like we use velocity for the bulk or anything like that, that this is just hardware here, right? This is an, in addition to, because we still receive that, and we take advantage of that in our budget. Thank so you. it's about 60% there too. Yes, this is just purely hardware. Gotcha. Any other questions? Moving on to 3.04, this is a, a, a an agreement for a software called Gaggle Net. Incorporated and uh, it essentially, uh, well, I'll let uh, Mr. Mosley speak a little bit more on behalf of what this product provides. Hi, so Gaggle is a student safety software. Uh, it ties into their students' accounts. It'll look for things on their documents, their emails related to self-harm, suicide, drug use, abuse, things of that nature. Um, we looked at five products. We um, narrowed it down to three. And then we had a committee, committee look at those three, and uh, Gaggle was the one that they felt would best suit our students. We do have other products similar to this for just web searches, but uh, that's only a piece of the information that students are putting out there. So. I'm not very good at public speaking. <laughs> um, but we did run a test uh, over Christmas and in uh, January, and uh, the amount of information it picked up was, was pretty enlightening. Um, one thing we like about this product is that it also has a human component that will look over the flagged items so to kind of eliminate some of the uh, potential for error. Um, and then on the most serious ones, they'll actually make a, a phone call versus just sending an email to alert. But uh, you really think of how much we're doing with the students online. Um, that, you know, we're talking about their uh, um, social and emotional wellness. But this is something that, you know, working with our counselors would definitely be a beneficial product for the district. I have a couple questions for you, Mr. Mosley, and I, I know why it's coming through this committee because it is a contract and it is IP, uh, but I, I, I question, um, has instruction and student services supported this type of program um, and the, what have they validated the need for it uh, because it is both an IP and a student services component here? They were involved in the committee when we were evaluating products. This initially came up. Um, on an ask from, uh, from the core team uh, based on a situation that occurred at one of our middle schools. Um, 
that you know if uh, this type of product could have helped uh, prevented some of the issues that happened in that case. So they were definitely involved in that as well as our counselors and our core admin and building administrators as well. Additionally, it, is, it certainly transcends just being an instructionally focused item. This is more about security. Of course, we've seen an increase across the country and our district is not impervious to this, um, where we, we have a number of concerns around um, cyber threats. Uh, we've seen an increase in students uh, being bullied um, via either cyber or some of our um, electronic platforms, some of our social media platforms. And so in addition to that single incident that um, Mr. Mosley is alluding to, this is certainly a strategic approach to make sure that we have something in place that is preventative as opposed to waiting until there are issues that occur with our students. And there are district, a couple of districts around us that use this product as well. Mm -hmm. I did reach out to our RTSG members uh, and some of them spoke highly of it. Purely on the IT side. Um, does this work only on MTS DIA devices or is it any time a student accesses any uh, web-based MTSD software platform? So. This is tied to their MTSD um, Microsoft accounts as well as their Google accounts. So they have to be logged in with their account. Um, if they're doing a web search, they have to be logged in with their MTSD account for it to find it. Uh, but it will also search their Google Drive as well as their Microsoft OneDrive. So any documents that they have uh, saved on the school district's account, it will monitor that. And, when and that flags, could be from any device. So, so when it flags a student or it tracks the students, who owns the tracking information on a student and where does it reside and how is it disposed of after a certain period of time? Because we're going we're gonna to scan all the students in the district to look for this and we're going to know what they search, what they're looking at, what their habits are. How do we protect those students from being targeted by advertisers, production, uh, other products? Um, how do we ensure that they're, you know, the student that's going around doing like normal student things isn't at risk of? So how, Gag how do we Gaggle's that? very aware of that um, and they hold this information security very highly and they do not sell the student's information. Um, I can look deeper into that and get more information on that from our rep for you. And if I can add to that, uh, they have, uh, as part of the contract, if you saw it, uh, uh, two attachments, uh, both the uh, um, privacy attachment and uh, the student privacy attachment. Uh, there's a gaggle student staff data privacy notice that is attached. And in addition to that is the gaggle privacy policy, which is also attached. Uh, Acknowledging their responsibilities and uh, identifying how they'll take care of, of the records, uh, both in the disposal, complying with FERPA, complying with COPA. COPA doesn't really apply because they're not uh, logging into their separate website, so COPA really doesn't apply. But they acknowledge COPA as part of their privacy and acknowledge their responsibilities. And, you know, back in August, it, 2021, you, you raised the issue about student privacy, and, and, and so we did at that time create a student uh, third party checklist, which we review each contract with. And we did review this contract with that checklist to make sure all the items that are on our checklist uh, are in the contract, and they are. So I, I commend uh, you for that and making sure that our students' privacy is right. of the utmost importance. And I guess my question would just be on the being transparent with our students to make sure that they are aware. I mean, obviously, they know that they're, when they're using our devices, that their data is part of the district, but making sure that they're aware that their data is being analyzed and that they understand that. And I don't know how the best way to go about that is, it's, but I think we do need to be transparent with our students. I know in our acceptable use policy, there is no expectation of privacy for our students when it comes to their district account. So it's part of the notices that we send out on a yearly basis. It's part of the policy, which is on the website. Uh, and, and I think they even sign off on it as part yes. of the uh, yearly sign off. Any 
the other slide. Does anyone else have any questions for Mr. Mosley? Mr. Atul, you want to while moving us through? Yeah, I <laughs> one point of uh, one point I wanted to make. Last point on that is this is not budgeted for this year. This will require a budget amendment. So moving forward, three point oh five is uh, the this is the annual co-star salt contract that we have. Uh, it's for the purchase of the salt when we plow. There's ice. Uh, you can see in there uh, the details associated with that. Any questions in regards to this line item? I see it says we're required to purchase 60%. Basically, is like the minimum. If we request 100 tons, we got to buy 60. Is that? That's sound? not going to be a problem at all. I mean, we store a lot anyhow. Um, so even if we had to purchase it, just hypothetically, it was a very warm winter, we would be able to have it in storage. So that won't be an issue. And we kind of keep that's what I, my next question was going to be we keep track if we if it is a, a winter like until January we had virtually no snow or anything if we have extra we take that into account when we buy it for the next year yes we do but we have plenty of room to store it correct and then we have the right to sub sell it if we wanted to if there's a shortage or whatever and we got extra we can I don't know the answer to that question but I'll I'm, I'm just kind of curious fine. you know because sometimes there's a there's a all of a sudden there's a big need for it or something so we could probably enter into a cooperative agreement the with the town <coughs> intergovernmental agreement in it's certainly to something you need in erie pennsylvania salt right i don't think we could sell it to the the consumer out there but we might enter into an intergovernmental agreement with the other municipality and this is like a pennsylvania co-stars it's not the um council of governments that they have um it's that that's like the regular government uh that the municipalities use that this is the co-stars right uh, which is a state program but I, I know that like uh um the uh the county has a uh, a council a cog that they get their stuff from yeah this is different and for which most times they piggyback off one another um so i would have to look into the details whether or not it's the exact same it's um, something we've used forever and it works yeah okay. good enough thank you uh any other questions? 3.06 is the Mill Creek Township fees for 2022-2023 school year. These fees did not change from this current year. Any questions? Here none. 3.07 is the updated student activity account officers for the this current fiscal year. And that's updates for McDowell High School. Any questions? What's the smoking fee? 150 bucks. Yeah. That allows somebody to smoke? Does it? No. <laughs> no. They're, they're caught smoking. Oh, that's, that's the, the fine. fee for being caught. Oh, that's okay. the fine. Okay. Wonder if no, no, not, <laughs> not you pay 150 to like, get the smoke. You know, so. Okay. And that's per right. occurrence. <laughs> so, I figured, hey, you know, you got 100, you know, Christ, you pay $10 a pack for a pack of cigarettes. So maybe like, here's 150, I'll smoke. You know? Okay, my, my bad. Thank you. All of our properties are, are tobacco free. <laughs> three point. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> and three point oh seven. Is there any questions? <laughs> yeah, we just did. <laughs> Here none. I'll move on to uh, three point oh eight. This is the security grant that we talked about receiving. That was in the paper not too long ago. It's a half a million dollars. It does require us to spend. Uh, in total, we'll be spending about six hundred and eighty thousand dollars, and we'll get five hundred grand reimbursed. Um, this is a this uh, motion is just to formally accept that grant. Any questions? A couple of the things I know you wrote the grant. And there's a lot of questions. You know what's not being too. You know, I so I have to really give a lot of credit to Mike Gallagher, who kind of led us into the direction of the grant and then Tom Sambacino did a lot of work in order to get this grant uh, as well um, our SSO we I, we identified based off of the list of items that we've already had established uh, the direction we wanted to go to improve our security within our buildings we had taken a few items off of that to identify to pay with the grant it is going to be more structural um, it does not relate to labor um, with that said uh, we'll 
if we want to talk further details, we can talk in executive session. Yeah, uh, as it's not appropriate to talk I think about it's, we're one of only two or three in the Western PA to get this grant, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So congratulations to the team there. Thank you. Any other questions? Moving on to 3.09 is the Manufacturing PA Training to Career Grant Award. You guys, will, if everybody recalls, we actually received a $200,000, just under $200,000 about 18 months ago, two years ago for this. Uh, well, this grant here is again, uh, Kyle Buckholtz, as well as uh, Bob Zeruda at the NWIRC teaming up and writing another additional grant while we received additional funding here, as you can see, of just under $100,000. Any questions? So they're doing a lot of great work down there um, in the manufacturing lab, and uh, this will help continue to progress forward. 3.10 is a California Casualty Music Arts Grant. Uh, one of our teachers had uh, written this, and it is for a grand total of $250. Just a general comment about the the 3.10, 3.09, 3.08. First, I want to thank our teacher, Ms. Jessica Alesso, for taking the time to write that grant. Um, I also want to recognize the, your team um, and uh, Kyle Buckles and members for going above and beyond, going outside and writing these grants and securing these funds for our district. I mean, we're, we're right now talking about over $600,000 that people took the time to step up and do grants. There are grants out there. I just want to acknowledge the, the hard work that was put in on behalf of the district. Thank you. Any other questions? 3.11 is a donation uh, from Amazon. Uh, I'm not sure. My assistant uh, had received a phone call regard from Amazon. They donated a number of a couple different fire uh, tablets as well as some supplies again i thought we could make some use out of it so we accepted the donation and this is the formally accepted we already did 3.12 didn't we, we did yes uh, yes okay 3.13 accounts payable report any questions with 3.13 the only question i have for you and there is a significant amount of overtime with the custodials I'm assuming that is all related to snow removal and the 50 plus inches of snow we received in the last four weeks. Yes, yeah, snow removal, salting. When you're looking at the custodial as well as the maintenance the staff, I mean, that that's all it is. Custodial is a little combination if we're short staffed. Some might be working overtime in terms of helping assist in, you know, the shift before them or the shift after. But uh, a lot of it does relate to snow removal, yes. When we approve the accounts payable, then that does that come up again at the end of the month or it is it it does or does not correct we are just moving it forward to the end of the month for the entire board to approve okay so there will and be additional accounts information in there and additional payrolls that will take in place in between now and then and i didn't know if it was possible for me to change my vote probably not from last month's um accounts payable i don't have a problem with the payroll or with the uh you know but the accounts payable um from uh Attorney Senate might be able to clarify that. Once I voted on it, it's done basically from January or or no. You would have to, at the board meeting uh, or at the CAL, make a motion for reconsideration of the accounts payable and then ask the board to re-vote would be the only way you can do to, it. To register my vote. Uh, to, you can't change your vote just by announcing a change in vote. You, understand. Once okay. you voted, you voted. We would okay. have to redo the whole thing, yep. which I assume we've already paid those things. Right. Yes. So a reconsideration is probably not in place because we've taken action based on the prior action, prior vote by the board. Mr. Kadoka, would you, when I bring this forward, would you like me to separate accounts payable from payroll? Could you month? please for t for tonight? Yes, because yes. I'm going to vote just no on that. So. so. So you don't want it to bring it forward? Uh, he, he would like me to sep. I asked him if he'd like us to separate accounts payable and payroll. So we'll do it in two votes: one for accounts payable and one for payroll as opposed to both together as I've historically done like, like if there's a if there's an issue with it should I because it does seem like once it's approved it's approved um, should I separate it out now or should I vote against it at the end of the month 
Well, I think the vote for tonight is just for the committee to bring it forward to the board. And if you want to vote no in regard to a certain accounts payable item, that's more appropriate at the board meeting itself as opposed to bringing it, unless you want further discussion and debate about a certain item that you want the committee to address, then you could. Um, yeah, if, if we could do that uh, when we get to that point or whatever, if that, okay. that, that would appreciate that. Thank you. So uh, we're at that point. So right, we're taking discussion on uh, 13 point or 3.13, so accounts payable fees. Uh, glad to answer your question. What, what's the okay, concern? Okay, my issue is paying attorney Weichler um, that uh, is involved in a uh, separate suit that involves myself and Lou Aliota. Um, and uh, I was advised by my counsel that I shouldn't vote for that. I don't know if it's a conflict or what it is, but I just want it on the record that I don't approve of that. I mean, you can abstain or vote no, whichever your counsel has given you advice. And I, I can do that at the end of the month. Right. Okay, that, that's fine. That's when I'll do that. That's, that's all. Thank you. Are there any other questions at this point on any of the 12 action items? If not, I would like to bring forward items 3.01, 3.02, 3.03, 3.04, 3.05, 3.06, 3.07, 3.08, 3.09, 3.10, 3.11, and 3.13 as a motion to bring to the board meeting at the end of the month on the 28th. And I have a second. I'll second, second it. Gary. One last call for discussion. Formality. Uh, hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. You're on to uh, informational items, uh, 4.01, and I, I can take the first one. Uh, as the representative for the board at the uh, JOC for the Erie County Technical <coughs> School, so just wanted to share with you all, and it's in the public section also for this, um, the phasing of how the tech school is going to be renovated over the summers for this summer 22 through to summer 23. Uh, there's also a list of how the temporary moves are taking place in that building so that they can accommodate all of the programs. Um, one of the uh, great things that they've been able to do is to make sure that all the programs are still functional in the building. The reason that the phasing has changed slightly is because they're having supply chain issues related to the commercial kitchen equipment. So they needed to pause the renovation of the kitchen for the culinary arts program until they could get the new equipment. They also had some challenges with the structural steel for the new addition. Um, but they were able to work with all the contractors. Um, at this point, there is no change order for the change of phasing, which is a big win for all of the districts in the, in the tech school. If anyone has any questions on that, I'd be glad to answer them. Mr. Atul, I will turn 4.02 over to you. All right, good evening. Uh, so today, uh, tonight I was planning to present a PowerPoint regarding our budget that's broken down into several different sections. A little bit of, I pulled some information from PS, from uh, PSBA and what they put out last year. Get let everybody have a general understanding of how our funding works, how we compare, going to forecast where I anticipate us to end this year, as well as the first draft of our budget for next year. So it is a little lengthy, so please bear with me uh, as I will try to go through this as quickly but as efficiently as possible. Again, for uh, I like to start off every budget presentation with uh, our mission statement. The Mill Creek Township School District provides a world-class education that prepares students to reach their potential as lifelong learners and responsible citizens. Our budget should have that in mind in every line item, as well as with the vision statement. We look through here. This is, uh, again, I, as I mentioned, a PASBA or a PSBA <coughs> report that uh, was put out in 2020. But I, I think this report is very, very important in certain segments in this. So what this slide represents is the top three budget pressures are mandated costs for districts. This isn't just Mill Creek. These are districts across the state of Pennsylvania, with the first being uh, your cyber enrollment, special ed costs, and pension costs. All three of those are mandated. We don't control those increases year over year. As we move on to a little bit of most public schools are relying on local resources. As you can see at the bottom right here, 
it shows a, an amount of uh, source of revenue. So for suburban districts, you're looking at about $10.7 billion is generated in, ter in uh, re local revenue versus $4.5 million. Looking on the left-hand side where it says revenue sources as a percentage, this is re really telling. You know, all school districts, about just under 60%, 58.5%, is locally ge generated compared to 38.5 state generated revenue. Your rural areas is just about 50 compared to 48%, but your suburban is about 70% locally funded versus 29% state funded. We're no different. Uh, as you'll see, uh, as we're working through these slides, we're a suburban district and we align to those metrics, much like the most districts across the state. This slide here shows our revenue shares vary widely across the state of Pennsylvania. So as you're looking, this is every school district in the state of Pennsylvania as of 2020. The darker the purple means the more reliant you are on local revenue. The darker the orange, the more reliant you are on state funding. You look in there, uh, there's only two purple districts in Erie County, Mill Creek and Fairview. Pennsylvania schools are uh, among the lowest in the state in share of uh, education funding, or not in the state, in the country, I apologize. If you look on the left-hand side, it talks about your percentage of revenue from state sources. Pennsylvania ranks 44 at about 39% generated from the state. If the state's not co covering the cost to provide instruction, you're forced to look at your local resources. Property taxes continue to be a primary revenue source, as we had talked about beforehand. Uh, you know, within the suburban area specifically, you rely on your local resources highly, almost to the point of just under 70%. As you look here, this is slides more defined in terms of property taxes itself. In the suburban areas is about just under 58%. That's the state average. Moving on to pensions push the state spend, spending higher nationally. If you can look, our, our state spending is uh, number nine in the entire country in terms of expenditure per student. However, when you look at that, the pension costs are about 32% of that 15,000, over $5,000 of our education, per, or the, our cost per student is allocated to pension costs. This slide shows a trend from, if we look at the bottom left-hand side, a trend from 2008, 2009, up to 2018 school year. The red represents uh, pension costs and the increases over that time. The dark purple is the charter school tuition rate, and the uh, lighter purple represents our special education costs. As you can see, over the last, what, 10 years, uh, as of 2018, over 600% increase in pension cost over just under 200 percent increase in charter school tuition and just under 66 percent increase in special special education cost and i remind everybody these are mandated costs we don't control them they're state mandated these costs are growing faster than what our act one index can actually cover So if we look at the ECR, which is your contribution rate in terms of the pension overall, which is what this graph represents, is you can see as of the 2020-21 school year, for every dollar of salary spent, 34.5% is allocated to the pension system. This slide shows uh, the state and federal shares of special education costs decreasing. So if you look at that bottom line, that bottom line is the, that bottom line represents the remaining share that needs to be covered, which is the difference between the state share, the middle line, and the federal share at the top. Long story, over time, the local share, you're going to have to pick up more because the, the decrease, there's a decrease in uh, the contribution from the federal and state government to help contra or to fund our state funding, our special education funding 
excuse me. So as I rephrase that, is the state and federal funding is decreasing year over year, which means you more have to rely more on your local resources to cover the cost of special, edu special education. This focuses, this slide focuses strictly on uh, mandated increases to charter tuition. You could see again from the 2008, 2009, all the way to 17, 17 18, the increases, the increase in the, the tuition paid was just under 200% alone. The enrollment was about 100%, just over 100%. Again, those growth rates over the, that 10 year period is exponential and the state isn't providing any additional funding to help cover those increasing costs over all three of those state, state mandated costs. So I'm gonna go into showing a little bit more comparison of Mill Creek. That was a, at a state level, which we're no different. We have those three state mandated costs, but let's look a little bit more about how Mill Creek's revenue as well as expenditures compare. So this slide shows Mill Creek, 2021 actual results versus the actual results of the state average and local average for 1920. If you look at the local revenue, Mill Creek's just under 70 million that was generated as of the last fiscal year, which is about 65% of our total revenue. The state average is about 56%. The local average is about 37%. So what, what I'm trying to articulate within this slide here is, is we rely heavily on our local resources. Why? Because we receive less state funding. If you look at the local averages over here is 56% of the local average is state funding. If we don't receive state funding, we're gonna to have to make up that difference. And I'll go into some more details here shortly. <coughs> so this slide is just showing what are the comparable districts are that I used. So the next couple of slides, you'll see that I have an IU average, as well as a common district average, state average, and where we are uh, at Mill Creek. So this is our total revenue, or local revenue per student. The red represents Mill Creek, the gray represents the IU, black represents common districts as are re represented by within a 41 to 47% free and reduced rate and uh, enrollment above 3,500 or 3, and under, under 11,500. So where do, does Mill Creek rank in terms of total revenue per student? And this is from 2011 to 2020. Red, we're just below the state average. Well, we're well below the average of uh, common districts that are common to us and well above the IU average. In 2020, we ranked 201 out of 500 districts in terms of local revenue per student. And you can see this is a trend has been consistent year over year. Uh, for us to understand our local revenue a little bit further here is we have to understand an equalized mill. And essentially what an equalized mill is, is what's the tax burden that you're placing on uh, your district and trying to equalize that to be able to compare taxes across every school district across the state. So if we look at our equalized mill, for a common comparable districts, you're looking at Mill Creek's tax burden. The lower the equalized mill, it generally refers to the less tax burden that you have on your ta uh, taxpayers. The higher the equalized mill, the more tax burden. When you're looking at districts that are funded most comparable to us, well, we have the lowest tax burden uh, looking out of that subgroup which is important because it does drive a little bit more in state, state revenue, which I'll be talking about here specifically. If you look at the, that equalized mill for all those in IU5, we're less than average. We're right in the middle of the pack. However, if you recall, 37% average is locally funded. They receive about over 50% of the local average receives 50% of their funding from the state, whereas we're about 36%. But meanwhile, our tax rate's lower than average. We wanna look at what our tax rate is just overall. You can see it, take a look here, we're blue. I tried to highlight that to make it 
easy to identify. <laughs> Again, our tax rate's middle of the road when you're looking within the IU-5. And the IU-5, I, I should have clarified this, I apologize, is mostly Erie County, uh, a few other districts a little bit south. So understanding uh, the our tax rate a little bit further here is the benchmark analysis that I show here. This was a slide that was presented by BDO years ago, and I just continue to use it year over year because it, it shows the effect of compounding. You know, in 2009, if you look at the, mil, the top sec, section here, uh, the Mill Creek Township School District and then the average tax rate increase uh, are the two areas that I'm focusing on right now. 2009, Mill Creek didn't increase taxes. 2010, 11, 5.32% increase. In 2011, 2012, didn't increase taxes. And then you could see the average increase in Erie County down below. Well, what's that translate when you're looking at additional revenue? So in 2009, 2011, because Mill Creek didn't raise taxes, they lost out on about just under 1.8 million. In 2010, 11, did raise taxes, which generated about 1.2 million. And then in 11, 12, didn't raise taxes, which lost out on about 1.2 million. If you add all three of those up, it's 1.8. However, that's not the only money that was lost. Because their tax rate adds on every year, there's a compounding effect to that. And that's essentially what we're showing down at the bottom side, section of this is the first year was out, Mill Creek didn't generate 1.8 million. The second year, it's 740 that was lost out. And then in the third year, it was just over 2, 2 million for a grand total of about 4.5 million. So not raising taxes one year impacts future revenue every year as we continue to move forward. As we're talking about tax rates, uh, you know, it's not good just to raise taxes. Uh, you, you need to really understand your economy as well. And so what I tried to do is I used two marks here that are for way of de determining inflation. I use CPI as well as the cost of living adjustment for Social Security. And I tried to take it back from 2006 to this current past year on what the growth has been year over year. Essentially, are we keeping up with inflation? Are we not keeping up with inflation? Is it what we're trying to measure out of this? Um, as you can see here, red is Mill Creek, CPI is the green line item, and gray is the uh, COLA line item. And I just took that, over since 2006, added them up, what's been the growth? If you look from about 2014, 15, we've been mirroring pretty much the increases in terms of growth of inflation. Prior to that time, we weren't, um, which in turn means lost revenue at the end of the day, as well as the economy was growing, but we weren't taking advantage of that. Uh, the last year, last year or two, you could see that that, that, is start, that gap's starting to widen. Um, but if we look from 2016, or uh, excuse me, 2006, MTSC is about 6.14% behind CPI and about 10.44% behind COLA in terms of growth, our tax rate versus those inflationary factors. And that's about a lost revenue of about $5.9 million specifically for this fiscal year. Understanding the driving factors behind our state funding is they have a lot of different metrics that they use. And one of those is your market value personal aid ratio, personal income aid <coughs> ratio. Essentially what they do is take whatever the value of the homes within the school district, the income, the, your personal income, which they take off of the state taxes and weight that across the state average. The lower the market value personal income aid ratio is, the more wealthier the districts perceived to be. So if we take a look here at what our market value personal income aid ratio has been, you can see red, common districts are black, the line in the middle, the IU5 at the top. So this ratio really helps explain why other districts in the IU5 are receiving more state funding. It's for, they're needed. Additionally, um, they don't have the ability to raise it locally. And that's the entire premise behind the state's revenue, uh, the state's funding model, is if you have the ability to generate it locally, you should. If you don't, they're going to provide additional state funding to help offset that. But you can see how much below our market value personal income aid ratio is compared to other districts that are comparable to us, for which those districts were also 
generating more local revenue per student <coughs> than what we were. So let's take a look at what how that ratio is applied to an actual state funding formula. I, I just want to focus on the bottom level here where you're looking at your district total, your equalized millage multiplier. We already discussed our equalized millage multiplier. Uh, we showed that those districts that were common to us, ours was rather low or middle of the pack when it comes to the IU5 average. Then your mark, times your market value personal income aid ratio would give you your to district proration. These are some of the, the funding formula you have. Our market value personal income aid ratio was rather low, as was our per equalized millage. Um, therefore, we're going to receive less state funding. So let's take a look. Our total state revenue per student you can see that Mill Creek's well below everybody. We actually ranked 415 out of 500 school districts in 2020. If we look at our federal revenue per student, we ranked 242 out of 500 in 2020. If we look at our total current revenue, that's if you didn't issue any debt and have any uh, large fixed asset sales, is what current revenue is, is uh, you can see that we're well below the average of both our common peers as well as the IU as well as the state average. Our total revenue in 2020 ranked 450 out of 500 school districts. Only 50 school districts generated less revenue per student than we So let's take a look at the other side of this, which is our expenditures. And uh, it's the same concept for the graph that you see coming here. And this is our instructional cost. We ranked 463 out of 500. We're well below our common peers as well as the IU5 average. If you look at our support services, we ranked 304 out of 500. We're about in line with our common districts. Our non-instructional services, which is really our extracurriculars, essentially, um, you can see we rank four out of three out of four hundred and three out of five hundred districts. If I'm moving too fast, please tell me to slow down. But I know I'm trying to move. Um, total current expenditures, which is basically all of our expenditures with exception of debt, uh, we ranked four hundred and thirty out of five hundred school districts. And then when you add in debt. Our total expenditures per student ranks 456 out of 500. We're not generating revenue. We can't spend it on our students, which means we rank 456 out of 500. So let's talk, I, I know a lot of folks that want ask about our fund balance, and uh, I think it's appropriate to take a look at our fund balance and where we compare in terms of others. So that blue block that you see up here, this is our fund balance for the general or general fund fund balance as a percentage of your expenditures. That's what represents the dot, the, those black dots everywhere. Mill Creek is where that blue block is. I tried to make it. So when you're looking at IU5, our fund balance is rather low in terms of percentage of our expenditures compared to those within IU5. You want to look at the our districts, our common peers that are funded most like us. We're about middle of the road. I am comfortable with our fund balance and where it is because we do control a lot of our own outcome as we rely heavily on our local resources. That means we can generate additional revenue if we need to. Um, therefore, you don't need as much in savings. Some of, let's say, this slide is, uh, I've used this slide in a lot of different presentations, but this is just to say, uh, we don't just not look at revenue. We've been aggressive in how can we raise additional revenue. I mean, we've brokered uh, deals with Lecom and Wegmans. We've uh, continued to uh, challenge us property assessments to the tune that uh, over the last seven years, about 124 million was uh, increased in property assessments which uh, last year generated about $1.8 million. We've sold uh, our buildings that we weren't using. Uh, the Nature Center for $1.5 million, Bernardale for $900,000. We've uh, developed investment strategies to try to earn as much as we can, although the market's not very good at this moment in time. I do hope the Federal Reserve 
increases their rates a few different times this year. Uh, you know, we've moved our discount rate forward. We've looked at our state funding, the, the reimbursement. I showed you one formula that was in there, but what, what measures can we do to increase that, our state funding? Uh, one example is uh, we've improved, improved our special education reimbursement by $100,000 annually. Our, our federal money, about $250,000 annually. So we're not just sitting still and just waiting for additional appropriation. We're actually looking at what we can do to generate additional revenue. On the other side of that is we've got to control our expenditures. Uh, you know, 2013, it closed two buildings. We've looked at programs that were underutilized. Uh, it didn't make sense from a fiscal standpoint to maintain those programs, such as uh, Alternative Education North Coast or the Montessori program. Uh, we've eliminated positions. Uh, we've continued to negotiate rates, whether that's with our workers' comp or our property liability or any of these contracts. We've, we're consistently trying to negotiate a better rate. As I just mentioned, we've been adjusting staffing with enrollment. We know enrollment's been declining over, over the last 10 years. Uh, that's not new to Mill Creek. Uh, Erie County's enrollment's declining. The state of Pennsylvania's enrollment's declining. So this slide here represents the, the uh, orange line represents the decline in enrollment for Mill Creek since 2012 or 13 to the, this past year. The blue line represents a just commutative change and adjustment in our staffing. So we have adjusted staffing according to our enrollment decline. If we look at our enrollment projections uh, moving forward, this is where we've been historically. Those lot bars represent the total enrollment for a year. At the bottom, it's 2011 to 2020, I believe. Um, and then the blue line represents the free and reduced percentage over those time. And the, or that, that's a purple line, I apologize. And then the blue line represents your um, special education enrollment over that time. You can see our free and reduced percentage has gone up. It's starting to dip down. Our special education enrollment is about peaked, about 18%. Our overall, overall enrollment's declined. But as I mentioned, that's the case for Erie County as well as uh, the state. We look at it that by grade level for where our enrollment was last year. Uh, it goes from pre-K to 12 at the bottom. You know, in sixth grade, we do typically always see a jump in our enrollment. Uh, a lot of uh, non-pub school children come and go to the public sector. Uh, I do expect kindergarten to bounce back. Uh, we are experiencing, looking at our real estate transfer data as well as our earned income tax data, uh, a lot of younger families are moving into Mill Creek. So I, I do expect us to buck the trend, for lack of a better expression here, in terms of you know, our uh, enrollment to increase. I don't expect that to be substantial or material at all, but I, I don't expect to see that decline that we've been experiencing. So that takes us, I wanted to explain how our money is generated uh, and then how we compare in terms of spending. Now we're moving into where we expect to end this year. So starting off with local revenue, um, if we look at our real estate taxes, we expect to have a positive variance of about three hundred and forty thousand uh, dollars. This this slide shows our local revenue down the left hand side, uh, where we ended this past fiscal year, our budget, then the forecast, and a variance and a percent change. So I do expect that we'll end the year about three hundred. The local real estate taxes, but have a positive variance of about three hundred thirty seven. Uh, I'm not entirely certain why since COVID hit, we've actually collected better on our property taxes than we have historically. Uh, I can't explain that trend, but if we are collecting more in our real estate taxes, that means our delinquent, which you can see down third from the bottom is gonna be less because there's less to collect in delinquent. So those two really need to be offset. Our earned income tax, our EIT is $140,000 positive. We've really, re LST, EIT, we've rebounded to pre-COVID levels. Uh, our real estate transfer tax, as I mentioned, uh, the rather large growth and high demand for properties has driven that line item to be a surplus of uh, 410,000. 
Uh, as we talked about our interest rates, they haven't been where we expected them to be. However, we hope the Federal Reserve will adjust rates multiple times this year, which would change that outcome. That gives us a positive variance of about $549,000 for this current fiscal year. We look at our state. Uh, I'm gonna focus on the basic ed fun funding formula as well as the special ed school age. The state and their budget this year did have additional appropriation, which gave us additional 376,000 for basic ed fu funding as well as 97 for our um, special ed funding. Our basic ed social security as well as the bottom line item, our state share for retirement contribution. I, I will show that we, we're expecting to spend less per or less than expected for salaries. Those are all a percentage of salaries. So if you don't spend as much in salaries, you're not going to have as much reimbursement back. But overall, a positive variance of 446000 Our federal money, it's rather level with the exception of how we're planning to use our uh, ESSER money, the stimulus money, we are used more than what we anticipated in the budget. We're expecting to use about 1.34 million more. So that's about $1.3 million positive surplus. If we look at that over the time, 2020, 2021 budget, our forecast, you can see where we're trending over time. And again, just under 64% of our total revenue is locally generated. Looking at the other side, uh, looking at our uh, salaries. So our administration salaries, we're actually expecting a positive balance of just under $40,000. We had some positions move uh, over the course of this for retirement or movement into new positions. And those transitions and the timing to replace those positions is generating that savings. The teachers uh, has about one point, just under $1.9 million savings that line item uh, that's a primarily result of 26 open positions if you go and look at loas uh, that's going to need to be offset with the teachers because uh, we have a negative variance of about 1.5 million because we have 40 loas and then uh some do we have of a chart, do we have a chart that would show our salaries compared to the 500 districts in pennsylvania you know like are we in the top 100? Are we in the top 200? Are we middle of the pack? I could provide that next, the next presentation. Mm -hmm. Still coming up? Not here tonight. I didn't include that, but oh, okay. I, I'll, when I, I'm going to have to give an updated budget report anyway, and I could provide that. Please, thank you. Um, Secretary Classified had a positive variance of 130,000. That's because of uh, we haven't rehired a couple of positions. That's offset by uh, the expected hiring of these positions. Uh, and then not to mention I had two positions budgeted in this line item, but they're one of them being paid out of the technical support line item and the other one we still haven't hired. So there's gonna be a savings all year long if we haven't hired the position. Uh, you can see the overtime over, if I move down into the custodial SSO, uh, it's a, a negative or a positive variance there as well. Well, it's the timing of filling our custodial open positions. We've had a lot of turnover, uh, especially when you go down to the educational assistant. There's $136,000 savings. The timing of these positions that have been open, those taking unpaid days, we still have eight positions that were open. Um, so with the massive amount of turnover that we've had, which is unusual, then compared to past, there's going to be a savings because those positions aren't filled. Uh, that generated about a, a $467,000 savings. Benefits, clearly your FICA and PEASERS, if you have less that you're paying in salaries, they're a percentage of salaries, therefore you're gonna have a savings for those two line items. This is all offset by healthcare. Histori or over the last couple of years, we've been trending flat. Uh, although the national average is anywhere between six and 8% increases over a year, we've been trending flat. Well, that's no longer the case. We're trending at about a three, three and a half percent increase. Therefore, you see the negative variance here of 284,000. As we look into all of our other expenditures, our total contracted service, we are expecting to overspend our at $1.7 million. That's primarily because we've tripled our substitute rate. 
uh, that comes at a cost in doing so, as well as we added a mental health contract that was going to be used as our funding for, but um, that's the cost of, that we're projecting out. Our property services is going to be a little over a half a million dollar negative variance. Uh, we've had to use coach buses because we don't have enough drivers uh, for extracurricular activities, that as well as a future IT lease that we're planning. Looking at moving on to a transportation field trip, well, we're running less routes than we historically have been. We've budgeted for 92 routes. We're only running 75 routes per day. That comes at a savings of 173,000. Tuition is about $2.9 million negative variance. Uh, that's a little um, misleading because $2.2 million of that 2.9 million is a result of a VOTEC construction project. That was all based on timing. We have the money in our fund balance to offset that, so that will require a budget amendment. Uh, however, we did in our budget, if we recall from last year, we budget aggressively in this line item for about $500,000, $600,000 aggressive, thinking that we would recruit students back from charter schools. That has not been the case. So that, that is going to be the outcome of this line item. We look at our supplies and utilities. Uh, a lot of that's a negative variance, but a lot of that's SR funded. So it was already accounting in the positive variance on the other side of it. Uh, same thing for the equipment as we're moving down. But overall, you're looking at about $5.6 million deficit. What's that look like over time? You can see that here. Salaries and benefits is about 70% of our total budget. That's expected. We're in the people business. Uh, most of the, our money funding should be going to our folks. So what's that look like? Uh, this waterfall graph shows the revenue as we're building up and then how we spent working our way back down. We're about $3.2 million deficit. However, as I mentioned, $2.2 .2 million of that is expected out of the VOTEC construction project. So we're about it, operating at about a $1 million deficit this current fiscal year. What are some of the options that we can use, do to uh, eliminate that deficit? Well, we can look at our ESSER funding and kind of re and redistribute that based on what we expected. Uh, that, therefore, we can use some of those funds to offset with the increase in the sub rate. We could delay our IT lease. However, that's only going to make our equipment older. We can reduce the volume of PD. Those are a few of the options that we have available to us to reduce that. Otherwise, that is coming out of our fund balance. So as we move on to the budget, this, these slides are gonna be the exact, pretty much the exact same, I just updated it. So rather than using the forecast, so your 2021 actual, and then your 21, 22 budget, I did 22, 23 expected budget, and then I show the variance by comparing the budgets. As you can see, there's a positive variance in the budget expected for next year of 396. That's because I increased the collection rate by 5%. That's been the trend the last two years. Again, that's gonna be offset down below with your delinquent taxes by 200,000. I was more aggressive in our, the LST and earned income tax for about $274,000 together because we are trending at pre-COVID rates and actually a little higher for earned income. So they, in total for our local revenue, I added about $713,000 to our local revenue for next year's budget. That does not incre include a tax increase. We look at our state funding. I, I took advantage of the additional appropriation as we discussed for our basic ed, as well as our special ed uh, subsidies. There's a few other as Social Security as well as our retirement. So Social, Social Security is the second line item there of 64,000. Uh, retirements, the bottom line of 390000 as salaries increase, as do you get receiving half of that in subsidy. And then uh, our rental reimbursement was reduced by 429000 That's based on our debt payments. Uh, so there's an increase of 613000 Our federal funding, uh, I increased our SRS funding based on our spending and what we plan to spend by 702000 So if we look at our total revenue, 51% real estate taxes, 7% earned income tax, 6% other. 
followed by basic funding 14, special ed funding 4, 12% reimbursable, 5% other. Our salaries, uh, essentially, we've added a Chestnut Hill a, a principal, assistant principal and the administrative line item. We had 26 open positions that are teacher line item that I budgeted at step three. Our LOAs, I had to increase based on trend. Our secretary classified line item, I, I removed the two IT positions and put those into the technical line item, but I also added an HR position. As has been discussed over the last couple of meetings, the technical side, you'll see the result of budgeting essentially. I'm moving from one item into the next. Our custodial SS, I added an additional SSO. And then um, you can see the other line items as you're going. I, I added, I did budget for overtime that we've been seeing in trend. For a, in total salaries, it would be additional $1.7 million. And most of those are at two, you know, at 2% raise increases. So if we look at benefits, um, our benefits overall, if your PSERS and your FICA is going to go up as because they're a percentage of your salaries, you can see those two items there of 128 and that 790. And again, I had to make up two years worth of uh, funding. So for the last two years, I uh, are trending out about just under 7% increase in healthcare. So when you add all that up, it's another $1.7 million that needs to be made up from this past year's budget into the next year's. We look at our ex overall expenditures. I anticipated us decreasing our subarate amount, so it's not tripled. I figured it would be about double what we have here. Uh, again, there's a lot of, we, we can discuss that further because that will change that line item material. Uh, the IT lease that I added in there for your property services, uh, I tuition, moving down to tuition, it is a negative variance of 850000 because I budgeted realistically how we're performing. We haven't recruited back. Um, we're going to have to budget for according to supplies and utilities. Um, a lot of that is ESSERS funded that we'll be working through. Debt, you can see additional $1.2 million at the bottom. That was expected with the debt issue that we just issued is $62 million. There's a balloon payment of $1.2 million this year. Uh, we plan to use fund balance. So long story short, if you look at this in this pie chart, we control less than 6% of our expenditures year over year. We look at that, what the outcome is with the revenue that I just explained and the expenditures, we're short $6.4 million for next year's budget. With that said, uh, we know, I'm going to look at that bottom bullet point first. Uh, there are some things that we anticipated using fund balance for in the amount of $2.2 million. And then that doesn't include a tax increase. If we raise taxes to the index, it would be raising about 2.3 million. So that puts us about $2 million deficit of our budget next year without doing any cuts. What's that look like to our fund balance? I showed you what the estimate was for 21, 22. So if you look at the bottom, this shows our different areas of fund balance across the top. If I just move down to the bottom by summarizing what we just went over, we were at $27.8 million. Our fund balance would be about 18.2 if we continue to operate and function the way that we are. And we would have a strong structural deficit moving forward. I'll try to get through that quickly. I know it's late. Any questions? Is it possible to get a list, Aaron, of our pilots? Because our local taxes is like $55 million and pilot is 400000 It's less than 1%. We're kind of curious who's paying pilot and what they're paying. Yeah, I have that. Um, it's a, it's not many. 50% of what their normal tax would be. Is that normally our pilot? That's correct. It just seems like a low number to me. Yeah. We'll provide that. Thank you. Mr. O'Toole, would this be available for the public to see it at a later date? Yes. It should be. It's videoed, so it will be available on the website, the video. We plan to have that under the business office department. I'll work with uh, Katie to ensure that. Thank you. Is it on the public side? Yes. 
Aaron, one of the things that you budgeted for revenue was uh, an increase in real estate transfer taxes. Um, this current year, how does that rank comparatively to the trend? Is this a, a high year, one of the highest years? Yeah, the last two years have been. So as you're projecting, and interest rates are theoretically moving up per the uh, statements made by the Federal Reserve, you're projecting more real estate <coughs> transfer revenue next year than this year, even though there, we're going to see an increase in rates I'm, for mortgages. I'm projecting more compared to a budget, less compared to actual outcome. So, it, and then it's not strictly just interest rates that are driving that, right? It's a low inventory in Mill Creek as well, is driving a high sales price. So, you, you've got to kind of take a look at all that data together. Any thought about going after uh, EIT and LST for people who are working at home that might have used to work somewhere else in the municipality? We're reviewing a program uh, that try to reconcile that further to ensure that we're getting the appropriate money flowing to the district. However, that is a double-edged sword. Um, we might lose some as well. Obviously, COVID has had a big change on where the workplace is technically located. I mean, overall, again, with the salaries, we saw the increase in, or the savings in salaries for this current fiscal year. It, I do anticipate us struggling to fill positions moving forward. There's a low supply of teachers as it is. If you look at the unemployment data for the state of Pennsylvania, we're pretty much back to pre-COVID levels. However, when you look at the demographic data and specifically the population from 18 to 35, it is declining in the state of Pennsylvania, the overall workers. So the volume of those available to take these positions isn't there either. So your projection for 2022 and 2023 includes some of those positions remaining open, or it, it is assuming that we would fill every position? I assume that we'd fill every position for the entire year. I, based on what I just stated, I mean, we do probably need to go back and realistically budget, understanding that some of these positions and the timing of replacing them isn't is going to have a savings, right? Thank you for that very thorough review. It, it looks like we have some serious work to do here moving forward. To yeah, what's the next manager? I, I forgot the the last the last uh, slide there. It was the timeline. So the timeline I'll present again with a revised budget. We're gonna sit, we're gonna have to go back and make some cuts based off of all the requests that were made. So in March we'll provide a updated budget of where we are at that time. Hopefully we'll have some additional money or additional uh, information to be able to provide in regards our health care and some of those other items that we need some quotes on. Because again, inflation's at an all-time high too right now, right? I mean, everything's costing much more uh, as it historically has. So we need to let some of that level out as we continue to progress through this timeline. So we'll present uh, a new revised budget in March with a five-year forecast in April. We're going to need to approve a preliminary budget, and then in May, we'll approve a final. Aaron, we had some buses. Are those like the first student school buses? Or are those the small vans like we use? Buses are first student. We, we have to buy the buses? No, that's all part of the contract that we have with first student. But we had like 1.7 million, I think it was, for I. That's the number of routes that we've been using. So not the cost of the buses, but the number of routes. So that's not like physically we're not spending a hundred grand for a bus. We're just paying more for what we're using. Correct. And then I just wanted to make a statement about the IT is that's kind of always gotten uh, the back going back 10 years. We've always kind of danced that around. And I think that's the most important thing we have is, uh, of course, the teachers. But the, uh, the IT part of it is is the world. And uh, it does not make sense to try to cut there. We've, we've never been a leader in Erie County for IT compared to other districts, and I personally want to make the statement that's not the place to have it. I would agree. So I mean, as of right now, the lease is part of that, right? We recognized the savings last year. We knew that this was coming. Uh, we were going to have to build out, and then we have another year of increases after that. 
and then we should be leveled out for the future. Just some in inflation numbers as we're trying to move forward. No more questions on the, the presentation. We do have one more informational item. Uh, I'm sure Mike has been waiting patiently back there. Not sure. Uh, I'll start. I'm not sure if Mike's online or. Yeah, I can, I can speak to it uh, online. So this is a report we had done for the exterior of all of our schools. Um, you know, if you if you go around some of the schools, you can see that there's some deterioration on the exterior uh, with some water uh, issues. Uh, so we uh, contracted Northwest Restoration to do a full uh, study of all of those, and this is the findings of the report. Um, so it, it's he's got it broken down. Some of it he said to address within three to five years. Um, some he's suggesting immediately. It comes out to about 2.75 million dollars. Um, so we wanted to present this tonight as uh, information that we obtained from that survey. Any questions? Mike, I know you and I touched base on this earlier, but um, can any of these repairs be built into the, the annual capital maintenance project budget? Um, are we able to manage it through that process or are we looking that we have to do this as like more of a, a lump sum one time project? No, I, I think we'd be able to um, take chunks of it uh, at different times, uh, some of it more immediate, and then some we can hold off for a few years. Uh, and then I know Aaron can speak to the budget. I know we had it budgeted somewhere. I want to say it was about $2 million uh, that we were planning on using it in one of those funds. Uh, and I'll let Aaron speak to that. Yeah, we did. Part of our bond and the resolution that passed, there was $2 million associated with this. Uh, I think uh, this is just overall for us to show an informational at the end of the day, Mike and I still need to kind of go over some more details, but it, really why we're here is it sounds like the board is wanting to extend this as much as possible for which we can try to include into our capital projects fund and that maintenance cost as compared to doing it all out right uh, for us. We probably need to come forward and determine a little bit more of what absolutely has to be done right away and we'll use the bond money to do that. Uh, and then try to come up with a plan to address it longer term. Is that what I'm understanding? Correct. So we can do that. If there are no other questions for the informational items, I'd like to move us on to a Section 5, questions from the public. Are there any questions from the public on any of the topics discussed this evening as part of the Finance and Operations Committee? Question, Luke? Yeah, I just, I just, I just, what, what item? Budget. Accounts payable. Quick question. Um, do school board directors review the accounts payable on a line by line item? And have you ever asked for any reports? or any documentation of those particular line items? Yes, sir. I can, I can answer as yeah. the chair of the committee. Pardon? Yes, I've gone through all yes, 51 sir. pages of this document, and there have been numerous times, both in a public setting and in a one-to-one -one conversation with Mr. O'Toole, where I've said, what is this payment? Because we are only afforded so many characters on a line to uh, denote what that purchase was for, and sometimes we they get creative. I've thought, I've learned their language. Okay. The Has any uh, school board director or, or uh, the president uh, asked for any of the invoices, statements from any attorneys or law firms that do legal work for the board yes, or sir. for the district? Yes, sir. We get a, yes, sir. We we get get a monthly report. statement. Yeah, you get a report. Yes, do you do. review it? Well, if we get the report to see the numbers, yes. Okay. Now, don't ask for something we don't review. No, do you actually review the statement? I said, from, I said yes. You said yes. Okay. Do you ask questions about the statement? Sometimes. Okay. 
Is there a contract with a law firm that goes along with the uh, submission of the legal fees, the billable legal fees? Through the, the uh, I know this has been asked and answered quite a few times through email. The solicitors is appointed through the uh, pleasure of the board. It's an appointment. There's an agreement stating the hourly fees passed by resolution, which is public record. But yeah, we get a detailed amount of different results of whether it's for the meeting, whether it's special ed, whether it's labor, whether it's real estate, whether it's other litigation. Right, and all the legal fees are legal according to the public school code. Okay, what's your question? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm asking, I'm asking. Okay, because on the section 610, the use of school funds, illegal use, the board of school directors in every school district shall have the right to use and pay out in a manner, right, herein provided any funds of the district for any and all of the purposes herein provided, subject to all the provisions of this act, the use or payment of any public school funds of any school district in any manner or for any purposes not provided in this act shall be illegal. Mr. Elliott, if this is in reference to the legal fees yes. concerning to your litigation, we're not going to make comments of that. I, I think you you I'm have gonna, a I'm right to you have a right, you have an obligation to inform the public that when you spend money in legal fees, that has to be a legal expenditure. This is involving your litigation that you brought against the school district, which is presently before Judge Brabender, and Judge Brabender will rule on those, those uh, questions, and this, this board is not going to comment on those questions. Okay, you just made a statement, and it is being recorded on YouTube that you stated that I brought. You did. You brought the uh, initial lawsuit. You know, Mr. Senate, you, Mr. you have a tendency Mr. to Elliott, interrupt. Get into the, what is no. your question for me or the Finance and Operations Committee? My, my about, question is, God. all right, do you know whether whatever legal fees are being submitted to the board that you're approving is legal? according to the public school code again we're not going to answer that question okay uh, because but i want it's right to the heart of your litigation which is in front of judge braben okay but i do want to correct mr senate right mr linda because he stated that i brought a lawsuit against the school district he did not say that you school board directors former superintendent brought a lawsuit, a counterclaim against me, which has been going on for four years at approximately <clears throat> 150 and $160,000. Now, is that legal, Mr. Linda? Yeah, and I would refer to our attorney who has advised you what the position of this board is. We're not gonna answer that question under the recommendation of our attorney. If we didn't have faith in our attorney, we would have a different attorney sitting there. We have the utmost faith in the attorney senate in guiding us in this direction, and all of the board members are in alignment in support of his direction at this point. It is not an attorney-client privilege. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions from the general public in the boardroom or on joining us by Zoom. I see no hands raised on Zoom. Okay. That brings me to item 6.01. I would like to make a motion to adjourn, and I would ask Jason to winning is being shorter, not being longer. I'll second that motion. All those in favor? I'll, I'll third Aye. it. Aye. Aye. Okay. That concludes our, our Okay, last committee meeting. meeting. Mr. Dean, personnel. Thank you, President Winchell. Item 1.01, roll call. Ms. Sitter, can you take roll call, please? Certainly. Mr. Dean. Here. Ms. McClintock. Here. Ms. Lupacek. Here. Thank you. Item 1.02, approval of the agenda. 
I would like to make a motion that we amend the agenda under 3.03 .03 personnel report for February 14th. Make a motion that we remove the HR coordinator two from the personnel report. Second, Can I have a second, Janine. please? Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Uh, approval of the agenda. I'd like to make a motion that we approve the agenda with that amendment. Um, get a second, please. Second, Kim. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Committee meetings 2.01. The minutes from the January 10th, 2022. I'd like to make a motion that we approve 2.01. Second. Okay, a second. Second, Janine. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Okay, 3.01, EMS testing agreement, and I've asked Mrs. Mosley, she's going to walk us through the details of this item. Yes, thank you, Mr. Dean and the uh, PMP committee. This contract is uh, a service agreement that we would be entering into with um, EMS uh, medical testing um, so that we would be able to afford a testing site on district for our student, um, students' families and our staff. Uh, it would be housed at uh, the Mill Creek Education Center so that it was a centralized location. Um, currently, um, under this contract, based on the number of cases we had, we would offer testing three days a week um, between the hours of 10.30 and 6.30 on Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, and it would be offered as a drive-up service to our families and staff members. Uh, that would include PCR testing uh, with the guarantee that results could be secured within 24 hours, um, as well as in test-to-stay um, situations, families would be able to um, there's no cost for the PCR if they would choose to do rapid antigen. Uh, that would be at the cost of $40, which covers the test um, cost as well as the labor from this um, uh, contracted uh, group that we would be working with. We're really excited about the opportunity. Um, while the case loads um, you know, and numbers have gone down, we have still experienced many times where our families and our staff members have not been able to have um, easy access to PCR testing. What is our cost um, for this? Mike, you want to wait till this? Okay. Um, would you like me to answer that? There is no cost to us. Uh, this service, um, they have the contract for the state universities in across the state of Pennsylvania. And they work directly with the families and insurance companies for PCR. There is no cost for us. The reason um, out of all of the companies that we've been looking at that we chose this one was because it was the first company that provides the staffing. They do all of the um, you know, work to send the labs out and all of the reporting, and they work directly with the families and staff utilizing the service. So there's no cost to us and no staffing involved. Other companies that we had looked at were requiring us to have, you know, nursing staff on site to do testing, et cetera. So that was what made this the attractive opportunity for us. Thank you, and my apologies for getting overzealous. The only true cost to the district is space for them to operate from. Correct. Um, it, it, there does require a space. Um, they would be utilizing the former bus um, office on the back side of the bus garage so that families could literally drive right up to that location. Currently, that office is unused. I'd like to make a motion that we approve 3.01 and any other questions that we have for Mrs. Mosley, we could offer under discussion. So motion to approve 3.01, do I get a second? Second, Kim. Any discussion? So what, is, is this a first come first serve? Is there an appointment necessary? Um, it will be an online scheduler that we will have listed on the website that families and staff members can go on and um, select open times. This will require parental approval before uh, a student could come down and 
and do a test? Yes, they, the parent must be with the child and uh, there is a waiver form that is signed as part of the documentation process with EMS. What's the start date on that, Mrs. Mosel? Pardon me? What, what is the start date on that? Um, we are hopeful that this would move forward at the end of the month um, and that the entire board would approve on the 28th. If that should occur, then we would be looking at them finishing their setup and prep the, the first week of March for an implementation on the first Monday of March is our goal. Mr. Dean, this is being brought forward to the committee a whole meeting following directly after your session. Oh, okay. If we're bringing it forward to the cow, then that changes our timeline. Yeah, yeah, right. It's under the solicitor's report. Right? Yes, yes. Right. Okay. It's just for a point of clarification. That's even Thank better you. news. So it'll be in place, I'm sure, more quickly. <laughs> Thank you. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, Mrs. Mosley. Thank you. Item 3.02, policy 214, class rank. This is the second reading, and uh, administration has asked us to table this and bring this forward at the March committee meeting. So I'd like to make a motion that we table 3.02 and move it to the March committee meeting. I'll second, Janine. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Okay, 3.03, this is the February 14th, 2020 personnel report. This will be brought forward at the uh, committee meeting immediately following here. Okay, let me go through the items we have. Uh, under the MEC, we have um, recommendation for a secretary, student services. And under first student activity, we have one driver and three monitors. And we have a change of status for an educational assistant in central office to a secretary in the business office. I'd like to make a motion that we approve 3.03. I have a second. Second, Kim. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes 3.04. February 2022 personnel report. This will come to the board at the end of the month. Uh, we have a number of items here. I'll go through them. We have uh, Asbury Elementary. We have a leave of absence for an academic education assistant. Bell Valley, we have a recommendation for a grade five teacher letter of appointment. We have a change of status for an educational assistant. At Tracy Elementary, we have a, rec a resignation for an educational assistant. We have recommendation for an elementary teacher grade five letter of appointment. And we have a leave of absence of an educational assistant. J.S. Wilson, we have a retirement of a grade six science teacher after 32 years. We have a recommendation for a guidance counselor as a letter of appointment. We have a change of status for a special ed assistant uh, autism support to special ed assistant learning support. Walnut Creek, we have a recommendation for a staff nurse. Westlake, we have resignation of a math teacher and a resi resignation of a child development pre-K assistant. And we have a recommendation for a math teacher, letter of appointment. Ridgefield slash Sarah Reed, we have a change of status of a guidance counselor at Grandview to guidance counselor at Ridgeville, Ridgefield. McDowell Intermediate, we have a retirement of a secretary after 19 years. We have a resignation of a Spanish teacher, which was a letter of appointment. At McDowell, we have a recommendation for an English teacher, letter of appointment, recommendation for a special ed teacher, letter of appointment, and a social studies teacher, letter of appointment. And we have a leave of absence of a staff nurse. MEC, we have a resi resignation of HVAC. Uh, we have a resignation of a technical assistant and a resignation of a pandemic coordinator. 
We have a recommendation for a school security officer, recommendation for a pandemic coordinator, recommendation for an administrative officer at the elementary school level. And attached, we have a recommendation for the spring athletics for the coaches. And finally, we have the recommendation for board approved volunteers for the 2021-2022 year. I can make a motion that we approve or we move forward this personnel uh, report 3.04. Can I have a second, please? Second, Janine. Any discussion? Um, could I just ask a question about the um, Westlake? Are those two different math positions that we're talking about? There's a resignation, and then there's a recommendation. Is that the same position or two different positions? So the math um, math teacher that you have as a resignation, uh huh, and the letter of appointment is that what you're referring to? I'm just looking at the dates. There's an overlap of a of a month in January. I guess that's my. I'm sorry. The what, what was your uh, the resignation wasn't effective until January thirty first, but the letter of appointment started January fourth. Right, I don't think it's the, the, the same for Westlake. There was an um, opening for two grade levels. So it was a, available, or an adjustment for two grade levels for sixth and eighth grade. Okay, so it's two different people, two yes. different positions. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion? Yes, I have a question for you, Mr. Dean, and maybe Melody, you can answer this. Um, <coughs> we have a, a long, is there a long-term sub for the Spanish teacher resignation? Is that already in place? It's in the works. It's not in, may not be in place included on here, but we had an adjustment um, that you see reflected here. And the only reason I ask is I know we had an incident at another school where we had a resignation and we were cycling short-term subs through a position and Spanish doesn't seem to be a position that's normally an easy fill. So I just wanted to make sure that we still had someone there to teach that course for this quarter. Yes, it is still a hard to fill position, but we have someone that um, we're moving forward, um, that we anticipate that we'll move forward for that, that vacancy. And then the other question I had has to do with uh, track and field. Um, there's a discrepancy um, between the number of coaches for the boys team and the girls team, and I know that the Coach has the discretion to maybe manipulate salaries to have fewer head coach, fewer assistant coaches. Um, is there a vacant spot that has not been brought forward yet for the women's track and field as the salaries for women's is not equaling the men's and it does across most all the other sports? So the question is about the track and field? Correct. There are three assistant boys coaches. And they all earn the same amount. Uh, there are only two assistant girls coaches, and one earns slightly more. And I know the coaches have the ability to manipulate that. But are we, is there one vacancy there? Because historically, when you have two compared to three, those two would make the equivalent of the three. So that's my question. Are we missing a person? Is Mark back on? Mark Becker? Mark is probably at the game. You know, Mike, just from my experience with the, the track team, the, um, just because it's designated as a boys varsity assistant, they work with the, the girls team as well. Being this is a combined, uh, you know, the same head coach for both the boys and girls. So these five, um, these five positions listed here would work with both, I believe. I know one of the coaches listed there as a boys varsity assistant coaches my daughter. So, well, I guess then for for clarity's sake, we we separate the head coach out by women's and men's, and we list that individual twice. Then I think theoretically we should list the other coaches at a split rate twice that they're both boys and girls coaches, so that we see that we are equitably supporting both the men and the women of those teams. Fair point. I do know that we held um, 
interviews for all vacant positions, and this these were the results of those positions. I can get clarity on um, to respond to your question, but these are the positions that went forth and that were needed for the spring. If we could just have clarity for the when, board meeting when this is brought forward, that would be appreciated, and Mr. Becker could probably provide that by that point. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Linda, are you, are you asked about the, is it the, the Spanish teacher at um, MIHS? Correct. That position is filled. Thank you. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Item 4.01, no informational items. Item 5.01, any questions from the public on an agenda item that we have listed tonight? Mr. Dean, uh, you reviewed the enrollment figures, correct? In other words, part of part of enrollment and staffing, correct? Enrollment figures in terms of our students, students. And then the recruitment, the resignations, the hiring, correct? You're in charge of that? I'm not in charge of the enrollment, Mr. Aliota. Okay. In 2012, 10 years ago, how many um, students do we have in Mill Creek Township? I don't believe that's on the agenda item, Mr. Elliott. Are you reporting the, uh, the amount of individuals that are being hired, resigned, fired, et cetera? Do you? You just, re <laughs> you just reported it, right? Are you talking about the whole district? You want to know the whole district? Yeah. You want to know the number of administrators, the number of uh, teachers, yeah. no, I'm not reporting that, Mr. Elliott. We're okay. approving okay. a personnel report. Well, yeah. specific, Can I make a recommendation? You see what the enrollment was in 2012. You look at the staffing. You look at the executive team members. You look at the cost of the salaries of the staff. And then you make a, a report to the board and also to the public. Do you have a question about an agenda item? I, I just asked you, and you, you didn't respond. You want to repeat your question that was not about question. the agenda? Question. Do you know the enrollment of students in Mill Creek in 2012 compared to today? And do you know the staffing level of the executive team, the staff, the teachers in 2012, and comparing it to the loss of the students in uh, 2022. No. Fine, thank you. Mr. Aliotti, perhaps you missed that slide that Mr. O'Toole had on there. It showed the enrollment since 2000 and that, and the, the amount of personnel and the, the two lines that cross. So I don't know if you saw that or missed that. No, no. It was in a presentation. So that might give you an insight of that. Okay. Okay. Any other questions about an agenda item? Is there anybody online? There is no hand. There are no hands raised. Okay, with that, let's move on. 6.01, uh, I'd like to make a motion that we adjourn to have a second. Second, Kim. Discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Clerk or Mike? Thank you. Okay, thanks. On to the uh, committee of the whole meeting, Monday, February the 14th, 2022. Roll call, Ms. Mr. Dean. Here. Ms. Philbeck. Here. Mr. Kobilka. Here. Mr. Lindner. Here. Ms. Lupacek. Here. Ms. McClintic. Here. Ms. Newsham. Here. Mr. Winchell. Here. Mrs. Winchell. Here. Dr. Roberts. Here. And Attorney Senate. Here. Thank you. 1.02 executive session announcement. An executive session was held February the 14th, 2022, for the purpose of personnel. And safety and the Eliota Cabelka litigation against the Mill Creek Township School District docket 10276-20. Item 1.03, approval of the agenda. I'd like to uh, make a motion to amend this agenda by removing item 3.01 under the superintendent's report 
which under the personnel report to remove the position of the HR coordinator. I put that in the form of a motion, can I have a second? Second, Dean. All in favor, any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Against nay, that motion passes. So now I'll put forward the uh, motion to approve the amended agenda, put that in the form of a motion. Can I have a second? Second, Janine. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Against nay, motion passes. 1.04, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. All right. Okay, it moves us on to the visitor section. As a reminder, I'd like to remind everyone, because I know this seems to come up every meeting, that the cutoff to speak for five minutes is 3 p.m. on the Wednesday before uh, the stated meeting. After 3 p.m., the speakers are limited to three minutes. So we have many speakers like to speak this evening, so we can get started with the pre-registered speakers. And I believe the first one is uh, Mary Aldretti. Mary, if you just introduce yourself and your topic for discussion this evening. Uh, my name is Mary Aldretti, and I guess I'm kind of hit a lot on a lot of things, um, bullying, Public, or the safety plan. Um, we believe that each student is important and should be treated with dignity and respect. On Tuesday, January 25th, the assistant principal at J.S. Wilson, Jada Best, met the sixth grade class in the cafeteria to punish them for bad behavior stemming from Friday's lunch on the 21st. After she was done punishing them, she dismissed them to the kitchen based on their second quarter grades. Row by row, all A's and B's were permitted to go first. Row by row, lunch packers were begin to open their lunches and eat. Finally, children were acknowledged without all A's and B's were then allowed to go and get their lunches, row by row, leaving many students with 10 minutes to eat. Dr. Roberts apologized and defended her in the same email after I followed up five days later. I'll get all these email conversations to you guys also. He said that she incentivized them. I've only seen behavior like that done at awards assemblies, not why children were being punished. Punished rightfully, they should be if they were acting up. That's not what I'm mad about. She went in with intent to publicly shame them by segregating them. I'd like to add, that Dr. Roberts is the only one to defend her after I've shared this story with numerous people. Those children deserve an apology, not me. And there's a huge list of reasons why some of these students may haven't performed well in the second quarter. Shutdowns, back-to-back -back days of bomb threats at the uh, J.S. Wilson's middle school, close contact quarantines, my daughter missed a lot of school due to your COVID policies, and it definitely affected her performance. She thrives in the school atmosphere with teachers and her peers. She missed three days from the bomb threats, many virtual assignments with her Chromebook at home, and she was sent home on her bus with a close contact note that she couldn't come to school. Seems counterproductive to send her home on a packed school bus to quarantine instead of calling a parent to come pick her up. I don't know who wrote that plan, COVID at school, but not on the school bus. Not all students are A and B students, and a good educator knows that. Some children have learning disabilities, social anxieties, and problems no one will ever know about. Publicly shaming them for punishment is bullying, and I'm pretty sure MTSD and its rule book has a strict policy against that. I'd like to touch base on the mask while I'm here. We attended a basketball game two and a half weeks ago. Masks were required upon entry. I mean, the signs hang everywhere. But once we entered the gym, about 95% were unmasked, and there was zero enforcement. So if the signs are up, you're complying and receiving funding. So all this proves that it is about the funding. You all must think we're really dumb. 
You know that saying, money is the root of all evil? Well, this could not be more true in this case. Because what you are continuing to do is evil, and it's all for money. Masks are filthy. My friend's daughter had nasal passage surgery last year from wearing them. Her doctor told them clearly that the nose produces the second most bacteria that exits the body through a direct opening, second to the anus. I don't know about any of you, but I find that repulsive. How many more times does the Supreme Court have to overrule this for you to realize that all you're doing is abusing your power and you have no right? In closing, school districts all over the state of Pennsylvania are moving to masks optional, including our backyard neighbors here at Fort LaBeouf, who I might add were recognized last year by the Biden administration for the way they handled COVID. Thank you for your time and sitting here and listening. Happy Valentine's Day and please, and this nonsense now. Don't wait any longer. Thank you. Next five-minute speaker is Troy Prozan. Troy, are you there? You're on mute, Troy. Okay, we'll circle back with Troy. Uh, next five minute speaker is Jessica DeLorano. You have five minutes. Thank you. Um, I've had the opportunity to meet with Dr. Roberts and I just wanna say thank you again for meeting with me. It was really nice to have that communication one-on-one -on -one rather than here in the board meeting setting or through email. So thank you for that, I appreciate that. And I look forward to meeting many more times. Um, but after the meeting and then today, I, I really feel like, again, we're not being heard. I've spoken at many board meetings and I email the board regularly. So you guys all see the studies that I provide and see everything that I have to give you. Um, you know what I'm here to say, but I'm gonna say it again anyways, hoping that my voice will again be heard and the voice of many in the district. We need to go to parental choice immediately tonight. We cannot wait. Let the kids go to school tomorrow with that choice, a choice for masks, but, not, but also for contact tracing, quarantining as well, unless you're actually sick. I understand that that might not be able to happen tonight. Let that go towards your study. Put that into your study. Don't wait for masks. Um, also, when a healthy person is, when a kid is healthy again, let them come back to school. There shouldn't be a time limit that they have to stay home. Parents need that choice to send their kid without a mask. They can use, other parents can send a cloth mask, surgical mask, or N95 mask if they want to, but we should have the choice to send our child without a mask, and not at the end of the month immediately. School districts all over the county and state are doing this and reporting no issues. Tonight there were even many. You know this, we have been telling you this, we send you this information, we have maps, we have lists, everything that we send you. A transition period should have been done. This has been going on for two years, there is no need to wait another 15 days for, to figure out what is the best option going forward. We don't need that. It's been done. We should know. Let's not drag it out any longer. This is not about the health and safety anymore. It is about, it's not about pro or anti anything. It's about parents being able to make the decisions about what is best for our children. This is dividing our district as it has divided our country. Our children need and deserve a healthy environment to learn because we are sending them to school to learn and not be part of political division. Let's do what is best for our children and show them how to come together and be one amazing district again. The way the, and the way to do that is to give us back our freedom of choice. Allow us to be our children's voice again now, not in two weeks, because we know it is best for them. COVID needs to be put behind us so we can move forward as a district. That's the only way to move forward. The plan presented is just a baby step forward. And after two years, we should be making giant leaps. I wanna be able to work with the board on positive things in the district. I've heard concerned about bullying. A kid is gonna bully regardless of what it is. Mask, no mask. I've been bullied for not wearing a mask. So it goes both ways. We can't say bullying one way or the other. Um, but ch people need to, parents need to teach their children about respect. I have taught my children to be respectful of other people's choices. 
don't even question their choices. If they choose to wear a mask, that's their choice and their choice alone. And it has nothing to do with you. It doesn't affect you. As, as my choice to send my child to school without a mask should not affect other people. Finally, it's not these kids' jobs to make others feel safe. They are children. They should not be told to wear a mask to make others feel safe or that wearing a mask means that you care for others, especially when they are healthy. They should be in school having real interaction with teachers, administration, and classmates, and, ha classmates, and having real gym classes and real recesses and real lunches in the lunchroom. The masks, social distancing, and buffer zones have kept our children from friends, have disrupted critical years of important socialization skills and communication development that we have never that we will never get back. This has gone on long enough and can never happen again. We need to remove masks immediately and never move back to them again. And also, I feel like um, possibly I, I'm a very empathetic person and I very I care about all those kids that have died from COVID or that get sick from it. But listening to the presentation, the one presented, presented about gaggle, and I just searched to see what it was. And I open up their page and it says, the state of student mental health and safety is the number two cause of death for 10 to 19 year olds is suicide. One in six teens has seriously considered suicide. 70% of teens see anxiety and depression as a major problem among their peers. What is gaggle seeing? Increases reflect incidence rates per 10,000 students compared to the 2019-2020 school year to the 2020-21 school year. There was an 87% increase in suicide and self-harm, 104% increase in violence towards others, 151% increase in nudity and sexual content, 134 increase in drug and alcohol. What is the difference between those two years? COVID. Let's put it behind us and move forward. Get this, these kids' mental health back where it should be. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Next speaker for five minutes is uh, Kelly Gilmore. Kelly, you have five minutes. Thank you. Um, just as we were sitting here tonight, three school districts went parent choice for masking. They're Fairview, Corey, and Girard, just so everybody knows. Um, I come to you today quite different than I have in previous meetings. This time I come to you, give you an opportunity to rectify the wrongs that you have done over the last two years to our children and to your staff. As I've stated before, you have been following bad advice, not just locally, but from the top. You have been misled by Governor Wolf, the Pennsylvania Department of Health, the Pennsylvania Department of Education, former County Executive Dahl Kemper, and former County Department of Health Director Melissa Lyons. Tonight, I'm here to put you on notice of an intent to file a claim against your commercial general liability policy with your insurer, Utica National, for all the unlawful, illegal, abusive, and discriminatory mandates that have been forced upon students, my children, and staff. I'm giving you a lifeline tonight by giving you the chance to opt out and change your health and safety plan going forward. If my demands have not been met in 72 hours, I will file against your policy. You might not realize this yet, but the entire board and district is personally liable for a predetermined amount stated in your policy for damages per claim. In your policy, each occurrence is one claim filed against your policy. Each occurrence comes from, each occurrence carries a predetermined deductible that you have to pay uh, to the insurance company before covering the rest of the damages. I am not only one parent willing to do this. If the demands are not met, there will be many more to come. 10, 20, 50, or 100 claims could subsequently be filed. I am here letting you know that you have been in violation of multiple state, federal, and international laws, and I have outlined all of these in the 15-page document I gave to each of you. I do not want to see any of this happen to you, but I, I don't want you to take the fall for those who have led you to make these decisions. This can be fixed, and it can be fixed today. First of all, the ones who voted yes on the most recent health and safety plan are in direct violation of your oaths of office, which I also hold. You swore to uphold the Constitution of Pennsylvania and the Constitution of the United States of America, and you have failed at doing both. Violations of oath of office hold a $250,000 penalty, and denied provisions of the Constitution also hold a $250,000 penalty. 
You're in direct violation of the Supreme Court ruling in Pennsylvania on masking. We have given you the newest lawsuit filed by our attorney, Chadwick Schnee, as well. This lawsuit seeks declaratory judgment that schools do not have the legal authority to require masks. Some of the violations that you have committed include, but are not limited to, practicing medicine without a license, criminal conspiracy, interference with civil rights and deprivation of rights, mandating of non-FDA approved masks, PCR testing and vaccines under EUA, Child Endangerment Act, Declaration of Human Rights, Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the Individuals with Disabilities Act, violations of color of law, Geneva Declaration of Rights of the Child, and most notably, the Nuremberg Code. You have 72 hours upon receipt of this notice to correct these violations. End mandatory masking and move to parent choice. Contact tracing must move to a non-discriminatory manner. Quarantine is to be used only for those who have tested positive for COVID-19 virus, and though it is recommended and not enforced by the local Department of Health. And any COVID-19 testing that is without, without express consent of the student, parent, guardian, or staff without coercion. This means students will not be limited or excluded from any sports, activities, attending school if they decide not to take a COVID-19 test. Stop all forms of COVID-19 propaganda on school grounds, whether it be through verbal speech by staff and or administrators, signage throughout the building, and or advertising of COVID-19 in any aspect of the building. End all vaccine clinics on school grounds. And all discriminatory treatment of unvaccinated students and staff as it pertains to masking, quarantine, and contact tracing and COVID-19 testing requirements. Destroy any and all databases, files, paper trails of COVID-19 vaccination status on students and staff. It will no longer be needed based upon the requirements mentioned above. Holding on to these could lead to the continued discrimination of students and staff. Again, this is all to help you get out of a situation which may hold you personally liable. I hope you take this seriously and vote to end the COVID-19 mandate, specifically masking tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, uh, let's circle back with Troy Prozan. Troy, are you, uh, I see that you're on, I'd like to speak. Uh, yeah, um, so I just wanted to... Yeah, five minutes, right? Yep, yep, okay. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, we knew this day was coming. Um, I know that a lot of you guys thought we were bluffing, especially the solicitor, which is why the lawsuit was filed in the Commonwealth against every school district in Pennsylvania and the Department of Education. Um, earlier in the, in, the, in the meeting, I had asked Attorney, Attorney Senate about the public school code which we know that the General Assembly writes the code, passes the law for um, the, the, the school districts. Well, what's interesting is, is that in September, uh, not only did I see the interview, but I saw the quotes um, by Governor Wolf. He had asked the General Assembly to pass a bill which would require masking in schools, which of course they rejected. So if it was already in law, why would the governor ask the General Assembly to pass the bill to require masking in schools if it already existed? You guys have got bad legal advice from solic Solicitor Senate at the end of the day. And your first priority should be to get rid of them. I mean, we have a guy, we, we have a guy that's representing our school district that was, I quote, saying, looking at the test scores, I don't think your students can read a newspaper. Do we really want this, this guy? Representing us, he clearly doesn't care about the kids. And, and I don't understand why nobody on this board challenged him. He's been wrong since day one. He said that Governor Wolf and Allison Beam's mandate was legal. Well, the Supreme Court, they disagree. And then I'd just like to touch on one other thing. Um, back on January 24th, uh, Dr. Roberts had. Um, cited, well, I'll just read a couple quotes about the virtual tax against the teachers and staff. And he has cited an email that he had received. Um, and he had stated that, so I had sent him an email on January 18th. And in his dialogue on the 24th, he said that 24 hours prior to the email, he received a phone call and someone told him to go to hell. Well, what I find interesting is, is the district was closed on 
the 17th, which would have been 24 hours prior to me sending the email. And under the right to know that was filed, he tried to tie the phone call into the email that I sent, which if you read the context of the email, it wasn't even anything that he had said. So I don't know, I, I really don't know what's happening here, but the district is, is, is failing. And I know that at the end of every board meeting, um, someone likes to, you know, have some quotes. So I have one. Selfish people often mistake selfishness for strength. It takes no talent, no intelligence, no self-control, and no effort to sacrifice other people for your ego. And by the way, Mr. Dean, you shouldn't worry about the way Lou wears his mask because I've seen most of you guys out in public mask free. I mean, what? You only scared of COVID in schools around kids? What you really should be worried about is the fact that you sold our kids out for money. That's what you should be worried about, Mr. Dean. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Troy. As a reminder, please address the board and the administration and the holistic and not individual. Thank you. Okay. Um, next speaker is for five minutes is Kelly Berzik. Kelly, I see you're online. Can you hear us? Hey, Kelly. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, you have five minutes, Kelly. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, Mill Creek Township School District community. And wow, kudos to everyone for still being there at almost 1030. Um, my name is Kelly Beresik. I am the academic interventionist at McDowell Intermediate High School. I am here this evening representing the Mill Creek Education Association, where I proudly serve as the secretary of our teachers union. On behalf of the MEA, we feel it necessary to share a message of gratitude to the board for their eagerness and dedication to meet with our teachers over the past two months. As of last Monday, our board members have traveled to our five elementary schools, our three middle schools, our two high schools, and on to Ridgefield to see our teachers serving the Sarah Reed programs. These visits requested by the board were welcomed by each group of teachers. The MEA leadership received feedback that was well beyond outstanding. You were able to see us. The morning meetings allowed the board to see how eager our teachers are to get started with a day of learning and fun with our students. The afternoon meetings allowed the board to see how tired our teachers are at the end of a day of that learning and fun with our students. You were able to hear us. Our teachers across all levels spoke with you about topics such as student discipline and behavior, school safety, professional development, and the rollout of educational initiatives such as school-wide testing and the curriculum and resources for both online and in-person learning. And finally, you heard about the need for more time, which everyone, everyone in this room and the online forum knows we will never have enough of. For almost two years now, our jobs have been transformed in so many ways. We as teachers have done our best to be resilient, flexible, helpful, and supportive, but we are still so often exhausted, frustrated, disheartened, and overwhelmed. So thank you for giving us your precious time, your listening ears, words of appreciation and encouragement, as well as thoughts moving forward. A few years ago, the relationship between the board and the MEA was frail. Through the dedication of both parties, we will continue to cultivate a stronger understanding of each other's roles and goals. The MEA looks forward to the continued partnership through meetings such as these and our board liaison team. Please feel free to reach out to us anytime. We greatly appreciate all that you do for our students, staff, teachers, and community. Thank you very much and happy Valentine's Day to all. Thank you, Kelly. Next five minute speaker is Danielle Strong. Okay, uh, next five minutes is Amy Stevens. Okay. 
Hi again. So first, kudos to those three districts tonight. That's awesome. Way to go. Um, I just want to say, let's honor parents' choice for masking. It's happening all over Pennsylvania, the country, and apparently now in Erie County. Um, you guys know that. It's time. It's encouraging that you guys are finally, um, there's a recommendation to consider parent choice. But I'd like to see the scientific information indicating why 2% is the magic percentage recommended for school-to-go parent choice. Please let these kids go back to normalcy. It's time. Let's respect everyone's choice. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, last five-minute speaker is Mr. Aliota. Your five minutes, Lou. Uh, good evening, board, administration, students, parents, and taxpayers. Let me wish everyone a, a uh, happy Valentine's Day uh, to all, and especially to the parents and our children and our grandchildren. May God bless them. I'm sure that um, all the school board directors have received my emails except the um, uh, Kim Kimberly. She's the only one I think I did not send it to. Um, I hope you're reading it because there's some vital information in there. Do you know what a surcharge is? I don't think so. 72, 75,000 people attended the Super Bowl yesterday. How many masks did you see? I believe it's been irresponsible by this board, the previous board, for the past two years to treat our children and our grandchildren the way you have done. Are you uh, violating any uh, school public school codes lately or in the past three or four years? I don't know. I'm asking the school board directors, asking the superintendent, past and the present. Where is the district policy and who interprets the policy? Is it you, school board directors? Is it Dr. Roberts? Is it Mr. Senate, the solicitor? Who is and has the authority to conduct all board meetings? And does the solicitor have to be asked to answer questions or make comments to the public? These are just general questions that I'm throwing out there. We have two attorneys in the room, Mr. Senate and Ms. McClintock. I have great difficulty, I really do, when I see parents cry about how their children and also grandchildren are being treated. What happens with a child when they are bullied? Who is the example for that child bullying other children? Leadership. Is that leadership? No, that's not leadership. If you got a pencil and paper, well, you want to wait until you um, listen to the school board meeting again. Take this case number 0082733. It's 
from Fox News. They just sent me a note. We will be reaching out to you shortly. I would suggest, and again, everything is coming out slowly, but it's coming out. The deception that we have in our government. I would suggest the school board directors read school board meeting Tuesday, March 29th, 2016. I think I attached it to your uh, email. Dr. Roberts, I would still appreciate a meeting with you on some various topics. Since your initial contact with me on November 20th, 2020, over 15 months ago. Finished? Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Okay. I don't see Danielle back. We have a few three-minute speakers. Um, I want to, I know one is here, so uh, Rebecca Liddell. Rebecca, you have three minutes. State your topic, please. Um, I just have a couple. Um, just the first one is the condemnation of harassment. Um, it kind of bothered me that Dr. Roberts was receiving some harassing emails and um, last summer, I, someone had obtained my home address and had come and her, not personally, but um, had sent us some harassment material in the mail. Um, so I just I want to make that statement in saying that harassment on either side um, of the aisle is inappropriate and um, should not be done. Um, I did not appreciate uh, what had happened to me, didn't appreciate what had happened to him. Um, I just wanted to, um, I've been working on a project um, it's a Google map and it maps out all the Pennsylvania school districts that are mask optional. We are up to 229. Um, we have um, personally um, either verified or had parents in the district tell us that these um, districts are mask optional. Um, and it just and it went up again tonight. So that's um, some very good news and very encouraging, I think, for this board going forward. Um, when you're ready to um, go through the study session, which should be held very soon. Um, the last thing I just wanted to touch on was um, that this is important work, um, continuing this localism, having these local school boards. Um, I know it is frustrating um, for a lot of us, but at the same time, um, we need our school boards. Um, we need this local activism. Um, I know that you know, I can't afford to go to Harrisburg or Washington anytime that I need something done, that I want something done, that I want to speak about. So continuing this local activation for us to have these conversations in our backyards is again, very important. Um, and as, as many differences as that we have, um, this is something that I will continue to fight for. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, a couple of these had, had spoken, but uh, they did sign up for three minutes. Uh, Rebecca Howard, I do not see her on. Sure. Okay, Alyssa McCullum. Okay, I do not see her on. And last one is Robin Broner. Is Robin here? Okay, Robin. Yeah, three minutes, Robin. Please state your topic. Um, topic is the health and safety plan. Um, I am a Mill Creek parent whose children are in kindergarten and second grade. I made the choice late last summer to pull both my kids and enroll them in what's turned out to be an amazing cyber school for them. Even though I haven't been present in a lot of the board meetings since then, I've been watching and listening to how the board has been handling the school year with COVID and masks, especially after the Supreme Court decision last month. I'm glad that you guys are revisiting the health and safety plan, but I feel it's not enough. 
when you choose over the last almost two years now to ignore parents who view masks as abuse or whose children have suffered emotionally and psychologically, but you'd rather listen to data from a government agency that has been wishy-washy on everything for the past two years. That's wrong. Every parent has a right to determine their own child's health and safety, period. It's time to take your talons completely out of our children and let us decide how our kids should live freely in school. They are not the ones at high risk, so why are you making them the ones to have to pay the price? Thank you. Thank you. Sir, please uh, state your name and address and topic. My name is Keith Canfield, West 33rd. It's becoming very difficult not to sound repetitive in the sense of reciting data, studies, grievances, Pennsylvania state law as it applies to the public school system in our speeches to the board. It's rather redundant, so I'll try not to. We've been very clear. We've made the case for the illegality of your masking policies in this district. We've also done it without throwing frozen water bottles, jumping on the hoods of cars and threatening people, setting buildings on fire. If factual data on COVID hospitalizations and deaths for children in the K through 12 range over the past two years have shown even remotely moderate numbers in cases, most parents would have found a way to pull their students from in-person learning immediately. It hasn't. Same goes for your sweeping mask mandates. As far as mask efficacy preventing spread among students and staff, we would have, as parents, chosen to mask our children. But anybody paying attention to their children know the real threat was the repercussions of the masking. When weighed against the benefits to COVID prevention in these age groups, the scale was tipped on the side of, the, of mental and physical health repercussions. That is an undeniable fact. You handcuffed every parent in your district by taking away parental choice, a move that you have no authority to do. On top of this, some of you have made the point to portray the parents speaking out against your decisions as uncooperative, selfish, divisive, ignorant, and even childish, which is, which is odd given that a common issue with teachers that teachers see over and over again is the lack of parental involvement in their students' schooling. Well, here we are. We're involved. If we didn't act on this, what will be the next overreaching decision this board will make in the future? And as of tonight, you have the nerve to ask us to be patient? What's another two weeks? Another 15 days? Where, remember that? Remember 15 days? Where have we heard that one before? Another 15 days. Okay, is there any other speakers? We're past the 30 minutes. Is there any other speaker who'd like to speak about anything else? Any other topic than mass safety, health and safety, uh, bullying, any other topics? What is your name? Well, if you weren't signed up, you can come and speak for three minutes. We don't sign people up for three minutes, Let's only go. the five. Sure. Uh, so I'm Aslan Slauson. Um, I just, uh, I'm just gonna make this real quick and simple. I have tried to figure out why you guys are doing what you're doing. I mean, I, like I, I know you, I, mean, I had you in fifth grade. I, I, I mean, you were my, my favorite math teacher ever. You, you had my son. I mean, you guys are not bad people. So what, I, like, I just cannot figure it out. I will say this, and Dr. Roberts, I don't know you, but I, from what I could tell, I, I liked you. I thought you were gonna be great for the, our district. I thought you were gonna bring in, you know, something new. And, and then I start to look into things a little bit more. And, you know, I, 
I, I know what you're a part of. And I know what you're pushing on this district. And it's wrong. And if you guys can't figure that out, or if you're a part of that, then you guys are wrong. And I can't tell, like, are you guys really, you, you don't know what he's about. Is this correct? Like, I, 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 you guys are very smart people. I'll just leave you with that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other? Okay. Here, now let's move on to item 3.01, the superintendent's report, the personnel board report. Dr. Arbor, you going to do that? Is Melody going to do that? Uh, the superintendent's report, uh, uh, item number 3.01, I presume is the report that was approved, pushed forward from the committee meeting for the board's action. With the amendment, with that one yes, item. That's amendment. correct. Okay, can I have a motion to accept the superintendent's report, the personnel report, with the amended uh, personnel report? I'll make a motion. motion. Can I have second. a second? I'll second. Okay, second. thank you, thank you. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Against nay. Motion passes. Item four, solicitor's report, attorney senate. Yes, uh, we'd like to take uh, uh, 4.01, which is the uh, Montessori Regional Charter School uh, resolution, and 4.02, which is the actual amendment to the charter. That's all one group. If you approve the uh, resolution, you're approving the charter. Uh, so that's all it needs to be taken. Just a little history. Uh, the Montessori Regional Charter School was uh, approved as a charter uh, back uh, in uh, 2018. Uh, at that time, they uh, uh, operated at two different locations at uh, 2910 Staratania Road and then 606 Raspberry Street in the city of Erie. The charter is approved by both the Mill Creek Township School District and the Erie School District at that time. Uh, in 2018, they asked for their first amendment to the charter, which would move the charter from those two locations to its <coughs> new location uh, on uh, West uh, 20, uh, 26th Street. Uh, in 2019, both school districts approved that amendment to that charter, allowing the move uh, of Montessori to that location. At that time, they advised us that they intended to add on to the charter uh, the seventh and eighth grade. And a procedure was put in place as part of the um, approval of the amendment uh, for a subsequent amendment or a subsequent request for adding those two grades. And that procedure was that they had to notify the district within a specific time period and then also provide a list of documentation to support their change in their charter to allow the seventh and eighth grade to be added to the school. Uh, they did submit their request for a, a second amendment to the charter on a timely basis. We responded by indicating you now have an obligation by November 30th of last year to produce a series of documents supporting that amendment. They then did uh, produce those documents on a timely basis, which have been reviewed by both the school district of the city of Erie and the Mill Creek School District uh, folks. That list of documentation included uh, the complete curriculum for the seventh and eighth grade, a copy of uh, educational reports for ELA math science uh, curriculum, uh, identif identifying the process of any accompanying rubrics or checklists used to identify the adopted curriculum, the Board of Trustees resolution approving the curriculum, uh, an impact on the staffing needs, an impact on the professional development needs, the proposed daily schedule for both seventh and eighth grade, the identification of technology upgrades required for those additional grades, identification of a plan for secondary transition services with uh, students with IEPs, Identification of changes to the st uh, student code of conduct, uh, identification of any changes to extracurricular activities, and then finally uh, a, a map showing uh, how the grades uh, would be laid out within the school. They have produced all that documentation except 
uh, the map, which they have not uh, been able to produce yet because they don't really know how the school is going to be configured, uh, including the seventh and eighth grade. So if you looked at the charter, uh, the second amendment to the charter, we, it would approve the uh, addition of the seventh and eighth grade, but contingent upon receiving the map once they have. So uh, the school district of the city, city of Erie has already reviewed this and already approved uh, the resolution and the uh, second amendment that would allow the seventh and eighth grade. One important point uh, about the amended charter is that there is a cap on, on their uh, uh, population, an enrollment cap of 650 students, which is the same cap that was approved as part of the First Amendment. So that hasn't changed to the cap. Even though they're adding two grades, there's still the cap of 60, 650 students. So I know that's a lot of history, and but mm -hmm. uh, just wanted to give you the full picture. And I'm seeking uh, approval of both the. Uh, yes, I can have a motion for 4.01 and 4.02 for the uh, Montessori Regional Charter School location and the uh, school second amendment to the charter. Can I have a motion? Make, Make a motion. motion. Mike. Have a second. I'll second then. Thank you. Any other discussion? Yes, President Winchell. Uh, for the record, I want to confirm that the Montessori is located on West 8th Street at the former villa not on West 26th Street, which yeah. Attorney Senate had said he stumbled there a little bit, but it is on West 8th Street. That's what we're talking about. That's, right? I'm sorry, that's correct. It's 2549 West 8th Street. I read the wrong. Part. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Any other discussion? One other, just general comment. I know it's late, but um, I'm assuming Mr. O'Toole has factored this into the projected 22-23 budget that we could theoretically see additional students uh, in charter-based schools because of this. Yes, I did. That's why we have the jump to 850. Correct. Uh, Aaron, how many students do we currently have at the Montessori School? No Creek students. Roughly 100. Oh, 100, okay. It, it includes both the city students and the yeah. No Creek students total. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have a motion, second. We have discussion. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Nay. Motion passes. Okay. Thank you. 4.03 is the EMS uh, testing agreement, which was reviewed by Mrs. Mosley. I have a motion to accept the EMS testing agreement. Motion, surely. I have a second. Second, Stalin. Okay, so any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Against nay. Motion passes. 4.04 is the health and safety plan. I think the recommendation is to have a public study session uh, within the next two weeks and uh, complete the, uh, an analysis of all the factors uh, dealing with the health and safety plan. That is good. Take it to the board. Okay. Item five, old business. We've already done that. Any other old business? Six, new business. Yeah, Any no. new business? Oh. Mr. Winchell, Aaron and uh, Mike need us to act on old business in okay. order for them to execute the additional spending associated with the design services. Correct. Right. So we do have a motion. What's up? We almost snuck it by me. <laughs> no, you're right. It's been a long evening. So uh, old business, McDonald Auditorium study. Um, the motion would read, the Mill Creek Township School Board of Directors approves the total estimated construction costs to move forward with all the proposed design concepts identified in the study for $9.4 million. Approval to move forward would also include an additional $161,200 in fee provided to HF Lens Company for design services. Can I have a motion, please? Motion, Dean. Second, yep. Janine. Thanks, Janine. Any other discussion? The only other discussion I'd like to add is that I, I I believe that we need to fully vet whether or not we want to link the walkway to this project at this moment. I would offer that I'd prefer to make a motion to approve this as noted with an ad alternate to look at the cost of construction for the walkway to be contingent on this work. Yeah. Okay, do I have a second to amend? Second, Dean. Okay, any other discussion? 
Okay, so now we'll vote on the uh, amended, which takes this and adds the alternate uh, bit on the block. Can I make sure that Mike and Aaron have a chance to weigh in on that amendment to make sure that I'm not tying their hands appropriately? Mike and Aaron, you hear that? Yeah, I guess uh, I'm not sure. Basically, what I need is I need to go ahead to move forward with telling the design team, yes, we are going to pay you to start designing all those areas that we discussed earlier. Um, so I don't, I guess I still need to, at the end of the day, we got to come up with a direction of what we want them to do from a construction standpoint with the walkway. Um, now they'll complete the study uh, as part of the Gus Anderson field by the end of March. Uh, I guess what, where are we at? That, that's what I'm thinking off the top of my head here. I guess, I guess my concern is the walkway may not be part of Gus Anderson at the end of the day. It may have to be associated with this project prior to Gus Anderson or may not even be associated with Gus Anderson depending on placement. Um, that's why I'm asking that we have it as an ad alternate associated so we know what the cost of it is and that we have it designed at the same time as this so we know what our cost would be. So are you... I, so would you want me to ask them to design the? I will leave it to you as to who you think would be best to design that walkway and to ask for that professional service. But I would like us to link the two projects together with the walkway as an ad alternate should the construction move forward. So then they would probably charge us four and a half percent of whatever estimate they come up with. The walkways, they're estimating, let's say, two and a half million. You want me to accept four and a half percent of 2.5 million to do a full blown design of an elevated walkway? Well, I think you need to start with is it an elevated walkway? Where's the location of the walkway? Is it behind it? So I, I that, that's why I think that I know it's really late and I hate that we're dragging this, but we need to have a be correct as to what we expect from the risk we're willing to take if we're going to move a tenth to. 20% of the school students on a daily basis and what their exposure is. So, so part of that study uh, that they're doing, that they're working on, they gave me the draft copy that we talked about earlier. Um, I mean, they're, they're, they're basically their approach or where they're at now until we tell them differently is an elevated walkway will cost a couple million dollars. We did not have any addition safety measures to give them. Um, so then they proposed the putting a fence of some sort eight feet off of the covered walkway, doing a gate for the fire lane, and then doing something down at McDowell Intermediate maybe with uh, you know, more road signage or something. That, that is their solution that they came up with. Now they could look at a different option, like, like you said, running the walkway behind the school and looking through all of that. I guess I need that direction of what you want me to have them look at. I don't want to kick the can back to the district, but I would look like the district to tell us what the most efficient way to provide a secure path for our students to walk that they feel is an acceptable design for this project. Um, and if you want to, if, it, if it's better that it's separated completely out, that, that's fine. I, I'm looking for you, uh, for your expertise on that regard, but I just want to make sure that we are coming up. I don't want to start to, to peg you to one type or the other. I think that that's something the district really truly needs to present to the board. Here are our options, and here is what the district feels is the best solution for this challenge. Uh, that needs to take a little bit of time on your side. I'm okay with us figuring that out. I just want to make sure that these projects are linked. So I'll tell you the, the two previous safety reports that we got, the most recent one, all they call for, um, right or wrong, is uh, just something to keep vehicles from, uh, you know, more vehicle barricade, barricades for the actual walkway. The previous safety report that we got back in 2017, 18, uh, their recommendation was to have two individuals uh, 
uh, with walkie talkies uh, be assigned each time that there's a change in class. Um, so I'm not a safety expert. Um, those, the, those are the two reports that I've seen. Um, I haven't gotten any other direction on, you know, what we want to look at. So may I suggest that we approve the motion as is with the understanding knowing that we need to come back to the board and address the walkway in order for the entire project to move forward. Aaron, thank you for the clarity. Okay, so go back to the original motion. Got to approve the amendment first. We discussed it. Oh, no, right? Yeah, that's what no, I mean, the, the amendment, amendment says that the two things are linked, but you're going to come back. That's all. Right. Let me rephrase that. That you, you, we know that the board's not going to approve the overall bids unless the walkway is addressed as well. But it allows us to move forward on the design work, approving the motion as is. Okay. Sounds fair. So we have a motion, we have a second, we have discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Against nay, motion passes on the amendment. Okay, now we go back and vote on the uh, original 5.01 for the McDowell Auditorium study. As amended. As amended. You have a motion. I'll make a motion. Second. You have a second. second. Thank you. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Against nay. That motion passes. Okay, item six, new business. Okay, item seven, remarks. Just say two, two quick ones. Today we did the pre-closing uh, on the bond, $60 million bond, with interest rate just a tad over 2%. So when you think about locking in some, um, you know, our long-term financing on these projects, 2% in light of the Fed maybe raising rates five times this uh, year, I think it was a good opportunity to take advantage of that to debt financing. Another thing, I'd just like to thank uh, Kelly there with uh, from the MEA recognizing the board's efforts of going out to all the buildings. It was a great experience. I think it was nice then, you know, that you've talked, they listened, they brought solutions, which is always great. And some of those things we're acting on, so, and so are they. So thank you, Kelly, for reaching out and, and recognizing that. We do appreciate that. Any other remarks before I turn over to Dr. Roberts? Take us home, Dr. Roberts. <laughs> Thank you, President Winchell. As always, I want to start by acknowledging our students and some of the amazing things that they're doing. Um, so our student athletes who showed up here this evening with a voice of advocacy, uh, I want to certainly commend them and thank them for being here to listen to the presentations around the baseball and softball field sort of survey. Uh, tremendous gratitude to our teams of teachers and staff for their work on the stenciling and memorializing the district's mission and beliefs in the boardroom. Once that was brought to them as a desire, um, we had Kyle Buckles, Mike Palmer, Tom Kedahi, and under the supervision and support of Katie McCaglia did this work, and we are forever grateful. I know for decades to come, each of them will be able to tell their children and grandchildren to come and visit the boardroom and see their handiwork. No board and community, I remain steadfast in my quest and commitment to not only keep and prioritize the health and well-being of our students, but our teachers and staff as well. And I continue to be com remain committed to getting back us to some normalcy, ensuring that everyone who was here with us at the start of the pandemic is here with us afterwards. None of us asked for the pandemic. We inherited it. And I'm proud of the work that we're doing as a district and as a board. And while there may be times when we have, we have faltered, we've erred, I want to echo President Winchell's sentiments this evening when he asked, continue to grant us grace. Parents and community members, you've heard me say this over and over again. We need you. As the superintendent, I need you. I want to say thank you. Jessica, Becky, and Robin for your comments, not only this evening, but your continued connection and partnership, disagreements, 
all of it is well received. I certainly want to also express gratitude to some of our other speakers this evening. Mary, uh, who left, uh, Lou, Amy, Troy. You know, my personal reflection of Valentine's Day, and I share this with the teachers and staff this morning, would be incomplete if I did not make a connection to the sort of historical context of the day. And it is believed that the day got its name as a result of beliefs. The violation and suppression of such beliefs and the commitment to uplift love for all. Many of us know the story. The story is told that Emperor Claudius II ordered the execution and beheading of priests in Valentine because of something that he believed in. You see, he believed in the institution of marriage and love. And he was beheaded and killed because of his beliefs. The one thing that I have prided myself in for the last 20 plus years as an educator is to elevate and uplift difference. And that difference includes personal belief. I have never and will never disregard, suppress, or oppress anyone personal belief. And I'm always the first to say, if I inadvertently ever do so, to be apologetic. You know, in one of the, the, the speaker's comments this evening, they alluded to my recollection at a board meeting of being told to go to hell and that the district is going to hell. And while I reluctantly recapped a conversation, the speaker called in this evening, and while they attempted to discredit what was shared, what they did not share is that they are in receipt of the email that they did send. And exactly what I said was said is in the email. And it's all going to come out into the wash. But let me also share this. I will never be bullied or intimidated in any room or in any arena. Never have, never will be. I will always stand in truth and remain committed to lead in this district, leading our teachers, staff, and school leaders, and making sure that I'm elevating the voices of every single parent. There's a phenomenon among psychologists who study social media called cyber disinhibition. What it means is that people will say things online, on social media, and other places behind a keyboard that they will never say face to face. The primary reason is being that eye contact that results in the reading of some emotional signals can be an encourager or discourager, particularly of information, if it lacks credibility. Daniel Goldman, one of our famed and noted psychologists, is part of the group, who points out that essentially the person who is typing the message online is indifferent to how it will land on the other person, and it lessens that person's ability to care for and humanize others. Several weeks ago, we lost a great icon who has championed peace around the world, Bishop Desmond Tutu. And Desmond Tutu made popular a Zulu phrase or word called Ubuntu. And Ubuntu translated into English essentially means, I am because we are. Your humanity is connected to mine. As I reflect on the last two years of this pandemic and where we've landed on today, with the possibility of significant revisions to our health and safety plan, I'm hopeful. I'm encouraged. Like you parents, I have not missed a single week, if I recall, where I haven't gone into schools. And each time that I visited, the schools of our younger children. It's heartbreaking to watch the struggle of teachers as they try to remove or lower their masks just so that they can continue solid instruction and pedagogical delivery to our students. I know hope is not a strategy, but I'm hopeful that we are really continuing to trend in the right direction and move from a pandemic to an endemic. I too no longer want us to have masks on our children. And parents and every adult should have that choice. I want to thank 
you all, those parents who are still here today and community members in the room with us this evening, and those who are listening and will listen and watch this meeting, we can do this together. We have to do this together. And I'll be overjoyed when your advocacy in two, three, or four months is not about mask wearing, but about something that has to do with our instructional program. I appreciate your patience. Thank you for your grace. And let's move forward together. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moves to item six. I'm sorry, item eight. It's his uh, adjournment. Can I have a motion for adjournment? Motion. Can I have a second? Janice. Okay. <laughs> Discussion. Already? All in favor, say aye. 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 We are adjourned.